This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. Three minutes after ten is the time. I don't. I don't want to sound insensitive, but is is there a finer story ever? Has there ever been a finer story for highlighting the hypocrisy of uh, right wing quotes thinking end quotes than the Labour plan to remove? VAT exemptions from private schools. I, I do not understand this tiny number of parents who are complaining about it. Why are they not being told by their friends in the Conservative Party and the British media to cancel their Netflix subscriptions or eat fewer avocados or possibly discover the, the, the value range of food that some supermarkets have on offer? It's, it's quite extraordinary how um, unaware... People seem to be of how ridiculous they sound when they deny the existence of genuine poverty or the necessity of food banks, but reach for the biggest violins in the world when a tiny number of parents warn that they may not be able to send their children to private schools anymore. Those of us who are lucky enough to be in a position to do so, do so because it is unfair. It is a, 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 a desperate attempt to ensure that other people's children don't enjoy advantages that your own children don't. And when that pool of people that can afford it shrinks by a tiny amount, the world actually becomes fairer. We may get onto that story a little later in the programme, but I, I struggle to, to contain my amusement at the absolutely extraordinary contradiction um, of attitudes on display from people who don't think it's possible to be poor, or indeed that anybody should be helping the poor in this country, God forbid that taxpayers might do so, but at the same time, the tax take should be manipulated in order to ensure that people spending money on education for their children, that 80 90% of the country can't afford, um, should somehow do so under the guise of charitable status. <sighs> Five minutes after 10 is the time. In fact, I'll let you decide whether we talk about that later in the programme. Uh, you can let me know your thoughts via all the usual, uh, all the usual channels. Because we must begin in altogether more serious territory, altogether choppier waters. Um, and and the, the, the level of understanding is extraordinarily low on some coverage of the latest crisis in Gaza this morning, uh, and I presume deliberately. So what I'm going to do, and I, and I stress this, what I'm going to do is try to explain to you what I think is happening and then invite you to tell me or to answer the question that I will end with. And that question will be, what are they hoping to achieve? So I don't know how much you know for, I'm on a crash course every day. Please don't think I'm casting myself as some sort of font of all knowledge. But I don't know how much you know about the Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, or UNRWA, as it is rather unhelpfully initialised as. That's U-N-R-W-A. When do you think it was founded? When, when do you think it was founded and why do you think it was founded? I think even trying to have a conversation about the um, decision by several Western governments to suspend their funding of this organization over allegations that some UNWA staff were involved in the 7th of October atrocities, uh, attacks on Israel, uh, it, it, even beginning to have a conversation about it without explaining two or three enormously important things is a gross a gross dereliction of duty uh, particularly as children who are already facing death by bombardment are now likely to starve to death um, it was founded in 1949 do you know why it was founded it was founded to care for um, the 700,000 Palestinian people who either fled from their homes or were forced from their homes with the creation of the state of Israel that's not an opinion OK, that's counting. And those Palestinians ended up in Gaza, the West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and they continue to work. Israel is, uh, well, the current Israeli regime is deeply opposed to UNRWA, not just its work, but also its existence, because it entrenches the status of Palestinians as refugees, um, it, it, you know, it, even even its very title entrenches the notion that Palestinian people living in Gaza, which is where we will focus on today, are 
refugees. And Israel, of course, has to reject that definition in order to pursue some of the policies that it pursues. And you could argue from a position of support and sympathy that Israel has to reject that definition in order to safeguard its own survival, its own continuing existence. But that is why since 1949 or, or since 1948, really, when um, the, 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 the removal of, of humans began, you, you, that is why Israel has a problem with its very existent. In, in Gaza alone, there are about 13,000 people on the payroll. It's impossible to exaggerate the role that it plays. It, it is essentially a government proxy, a, a government surrogate, a substitute government. It runs schools, health centres. It produces teacher training centres as well as um, medical facilities. It produces textbooks that educate young Palestinians. It is, it is, it is a, a, a crucial platform, a key platform of infrastructure for Palestinian people who suffer the twin horrors of being essentially blockaded by Israel and Egypt while also being governed by the, by the bloodthirsty death cult that is Hamas. And it is perfectly possible that some of the uh, people who work for the organization are Hamas sympathizers, as Israel has alleged. In fact, let's use the word plausible. It is plausible that there are Hamas sympathizers on a payroll of more than 13,000 people, just as the... But that's just my opinion. I, I, I think it's plausible. You may think that's unfair. The opinion of the International Court of Justice in, in The Hague is that it is perfectly plausible that Israel has already embarked upon genocide in that region. Um, that's the second area of ignorance that should be addressed before anyone dares to talk to you about this issue. The idea that the International Court of Justice could have gone any further on Friday than it did. That the final judgment on whether genocide has been committed or not is years away. But make no mistake, in saying that it is plausible and ordering Israel to uh, take steps and, and take measures to, uh, uh, to stop certain actions is, is about as far as anyone could have expected them to go, to go on that specific question. There is legal debate over whether or not they could have ordered a ceasefire or called for a ceasefire in the region. There is no legal debate among honest people about the significance of a ruling that finds Israel as there is, it is a plausible case that genocide is underway. So I woke up this morning looking at some elements of the UK media, not all, happily, but looking at some elegant, uh, ele elements of the UK media, goggle-eyed that you would think it was a bigger story to be talking about some plausible allegations against a handful of workers on a payroll of 13,000 than the plausible genocide, the plausibility of genocide currently underway in Gaza. Those are the facts, right? Those are the facts, that's not an opinion. There's no side picked at this point. That is why UNRWA exists. That is what is happening on the ground. That is what was decided by the International Court of Justice at The Hague. Those are all facts. And then we come to the decision by Western countries, some Western countries, nine or ten Western countries, to withdraw funding for the agency, something that Donald Trump did, actually, um, in 28, uh, I forget when, 2018, I think, and Joe Biden restored. So here is what I think has happened. And this, I stress, is opinion, okay? 12 minutes after 10 is the time, and all we've had so far are facts. Now we're going for some opinion. And it's an opinion born in a very tiny way of my own journey, for want of a better word. And you'll remember that nobody sensible denied Israel's right to respond robustly and, quotes, proportionately, end quotes, after the October the 7th attacks on Israel and, and the taking of hostages who continue to be held in the region where over 25,000 people have now died, including some hostages. So you start from that point and you don't know when you are expressing support for that position, you don't know what proportionate means. You don't know where that, when that support should end. But you're just a punter listening to the radio or, or a gob on a stick talking into a microphone. It doesn't really matter, ultimately, that you can't answer that question. It matters that governments can't. It matters that governments haven't. It matters that politicians haven't 
expressed a clear line on when too much becomes too much. Simplistic, perhaps even crass, to use a body count. 20,000 is acceptable, 30,000 is not. 50,000 is acceptable, 500,000 is not. 10,000 dead children is collateral damage. 20,000 dead children is genocide. These, these are the decisions that it takes courts years to settle on, but politicians don't have years to pick their positions, and they pick their positions so quickly, they went so far, so fast, in support of Benjamin Netanyahu, that they can't climb down again. If a British politician, if a, if a Tory politician, if Rishi Sunak, or Joe Biden, who is not right-wing, under most readings of the definition, but on international relations or foreign pol policy probably is, if they called for a ceasefire now, or indeed, well, let's start from that. If they called for a ceasefire now, the whole world would shout, what's changed? Why weren't you doing it two months ago? Why weren't you doing it when most of your fellow UN countries were doing it? What, what have you done? Why have you allowed all these further deaths to occur if all it has been is a holding pattern before ceasefire is demanded? And they can't do that. So uh, uh, by an extraordinary coincidence, when the world's attention was focused on the international court's ruling in, in The Hague on the plausibility of genocide being underway beneath our very noses. By an extraordinary coincidence, Israel came forward with allegations about members of a workforce that numbers more than 13,000 people. So desperate is the Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees. So desperate is it to keep the, in some cases, the only aid that Israel permits to pass into the Gaza Strip is aid policed by this organization. So desperate are they to keep those pathetic little taps dripping that they have sacked people already without investigation or conclusion. So desperate are they to keep things moving, to keep these rusty, dirty, pitiful wheels turning, but the only wheels delivering basics like flour or insulin into Gaza. So desperate is this organization that has existed since 1949 to continue doing its work that they've already fired people. No investigation, no fair trial, no, no publication of evidence. Israel's made allegations. They seem to me to be plausible. The agency has responded by firing people. Um, I, you know, imagine if someone on this radio station was accused of something awful and, and I stopped getting paid as a consequence of that. that. That would be more or less the equivalent of what has happened here. And... I think the reason for it is it provides a life belt for Western governments. I think the Israeli government has thrown a life belt to Western governments that they can now cling to, rather than having to focus on the findings of the international court, the failure already of Israel to obey its, um, its, its instructions to ensure, for example, that they do everything they can to make sure aid gets into Gaza. There are already protests and civilians trying to block the passage of aid, uh, aid into Gaza at certain gates. They don't seem to come under any particular pressure from the authorities. So they have thrown a life belt to Western governments. And, and of course, the more full-throated those governments have been in support of an action that the International Court of Justice considers plausibly to be genocide, then the more desperate they are for a life belt to cling to. And cling they will. And cling they do. Let's not talk about plausible genocide. Let's talk about a dozen possible Hamas sympathizers in a workforce of 13,000. That's my reading. I, I hope I'm wrong. I know I say that sometimes, and sometimes I say it a little bit glibly. But my God, I hope I'm wrong. But you need to give me a better explanation. You also need to include an explanation of why on the 4th of January this year, long before these allegations were brought, a former Israeli official called Noga Arbel called for the destruction in the Israeli parliament, called for the destruction of UNRWA, actually saying we can't win this war unless we destroy them. Not for reasons of sympathy with Hamas, but for reasons of historic support for both the Palestinian people and the notion of their refugee status. So that is what I think is happening. I think that the Israeli government, with these allegations, has thrown a life belt to governments who have been full-throated in their support of what has now been adjudged by the International Court of Justice in The Hague to be plausibly a genocide. And I don't know where to go from there. 
So what is this withdrawal of funding for this agency designed to achieve? I can tell you what it will achieve. And again, um, this is an opinion rather than counting. But I stress that it's not my opinion. It is the opinion of the people that run the United Nations. And their opinion is that it will, at the very least, and very, very quickly, cause an actual famine. So they haven't had the opportunity yet to dig corpses out of the rubble in Gaza. But the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food has said that famine was imminent, but is now inevitable. The news that the US and nine other countries, including the UK, were suspending additional funding to the agency, in his words, collectively punishes over 2.2 million Palestinians. So you not only have accusations of Hamas sympathies directed at nine or ten individuals who've already been fired without investigation or production of evidence, uh, being used to paint all 15,000 or 13,000 employees in the region as being somehow collectively guilty, you also have 2.2 million Palestinians being punished over unproven but plausible allegations being made by a regime that is plausibly in the middle of a genocide. And that's not my opinion. That's the opinion of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. 0345 is the number that you need to tell me either what you think is going on, because by God, O'Brien, you've got it horribly wrong. Front of the queue for you, because I l- would love nothing more than to have read this, this incredibly bleak and cynical analysis of mine to be incredibly wrong. And the second question is, what, what is it designed to achieve? What is it designed to achieve? By, by sympathisers, Matthew's been in touch to call me a liar. By sympathisers, I should be clear, the accusation is that the, these people uh, were, were involved, uh, supportive of the uh, terrorist atrocity on um, on October the 7th. That was absolutely important to be completely clear about that. So 10 or, or, or 12 individuals from a workforce of 13,000 stand accused of complicity in or contribution to that terrorist atrocity, accused by a government um, judged by the International Court of Justice in The Hague to be plausibly embarked on a genocide. It's very important we get all the facts out there. And the punishment for those uh, alleged terrorists is to cut off some of the only aid for 2.2 million people already facing carnage and starvation. I don't understand why. Well, rather, I think I do understand why in the short-term immediate analysis, but I don't understand what it's designed to achieve. What is Rishi Sunak hoping this will achieve, this withdrawal of some of the only aid going into arguably the most benighted corner of our planet? 0345 973 is the number that you need. What, what, what is this designed to achieve? in the minds of the people who are doing it. Because in the minds of the people who are fighting it, i.e. the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to food, it will achieve inevitable famine. What do the supporters of it think it is designed to achieve? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And remember, more perhaps than on any other day since this dismal business started, I really, really hope I'm wrong. It's 10.22. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 24 minutes after 10, Sheena puts it quite well, I think. I find it shocking, James, that members of the Israeli cabinet can make genocidal statements, as called out by the International Court of Justice, and the US and UK will still send arms. But 12 UNRWA members out of 13,000 are allegedly involved in the terror attack of October the 7th, and they stop aid to all 2.2 million Palestinians. How could you respect or want to fight for a government that does that? I don't know. I I take that point. Call them terrorists if you want, rather than alleged terrorists. There are 12 of them um, so far. And their existence is enough to cancel aid to 2.2 million Palestinians. There are members of the cabinet, the the, the Israeli government, um, who are off the hook under the International Court of Justice's jurisdiction because they're not involved in the military strategy deployed in Gaza, but they have made full-throated statements in full-throated support of what what, what is, I mean, at the very least, ethnic cleansing. And yet we remain, we uh, remain supportive of them. Gabriel's in Battersea. Gabriel, what would you like to say? 
Uh, hi, James. Thanks for taking my call. You're very welcome. Yeah, um, I mean, I think what um, what we're just witnessing, and, and I think everyone's pretty, I mean, we know, is just the extermination of the people of Gaza. Um, one of the things that your your, um, your 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 staff member earlier was asking me is about, you know, how, how this compares to, well, the UN. And I, I don't know if you know, sorry, I'm mixing my words a take little bit. Just take your time. Just take, take a moment. It's OK. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you can't use the word extermination entirely unchallenged. It, it, it is... Um, not crystal clear. Uh, plausible. It, it's plausible, Gabriel. It, 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 According it, it, to the International Court of Justice, it's a, it's a plausible word to use, but it, but it's not an obvious word to no, use. But it, that's it, that's me just splitting hairs for the sake of um, important issues. But it's not it's not central to why you've rung in. Well, so the two questions that we're addressing are: What are they hoping to achieve? The governments that have supported this withdrawal of aid, or um, what have I got wrong? Um, I mean, I, th- I think that's quite a hard question in itself. I-, I honestly believe this is just a way to speed up the occupation of Gaza. Um, when you just look at the recent, I think there was a recent conference held in Israel, an Occupy Gaza conference, which was attended by pretty much every senior minister or most of the senior ministers of the right. You've got Ben Gvir, Smotrich, Daniela Wise, you know, that, all of yes, these people. Yes, that, that was this, this weekend, I think. Was, this is weekend. that where we saw the footage of, of settlers dancing at the, at the prospect uh, of... That's right, yeah, okay. at the prospect. But, but on top of that, you've got the likes of these senior ministers making speeches, talking about how they need to occupy Gaza now. Um, I think this, 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 this UN, you know, this accusation of the UN, and I think what we have to remember is, you know, these UN staff members that have been, they've still been accused. There is still no evidence that's been done. I know there's been no denial from the UN, but... You know, the, the Israeli government's been discrediting the UN for quite a long time. Even just recently, uh, what's his name, um, Gilad Erdan yes. stood up in front of the UN on uh, Holocaust Memorial Day, wearing the Star of David, pretty much lambasting the entire UN for being anti-Semitic. OK, I didn't um, see so, that, so I'll have to take your word for it. Yeah, you, if you look, I mean, he basically stood up. But don't worry, I will. I'll, 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 I'll check, but I don't want to distract mm. you from the central point. And, and maybe, mm. and you, I think what possibly we're both frightened of is the fact there is no answer to this question. Just as there was no answer to the question of how much retaliation from Israel will be too much for people like Joe Biden and Rishi Sunak. Um, mm. What are you hoping to achieve by withdrawing this aid? They don't know. They don't no, know what, they, what, don't. what they, no, they, they just don't. think it's the right thing to do in the current climate because the alternative would be to go all in on what the International Court of Justice found on Friday. Yeah, and I think I think with the International Court of Justice as well. I mean, obviously, I understand. I'm, uh, you know, I, I understand the position they took. I think by the International Court of Justice obviously could not, for legal reasons, you know, issue a ceasefire order. First of all, they don't have jurisdiction, and second of all, I mean, technically, I think legally, I'm not a lawyer, but legally, I think. If you look at the legalities of it, Israel does have a right to defend itself. Yes, so by you know, you know, by having you know having a terrorist attack you know upon them, they had the right to you know in essence go after the terrorists. Now, how they're executing that is a completely different you know matter. So the argument is how they're actually perpetrating this particular assault on Gaza is what I like to call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what the way I see it is, it's it's literally just. Uh, um, trying to speed up the occupation of Gaza, and this is a very good excuse to do it. You know, if you impl- implicate that, the that UN involves agency. the tacit support, then, uh, and and maybe I'm a bit naive on this, but you're, I think you're suggesting that um, the the governments supportive of this withdrawal of funding are supportive of the acceleration you describe, and you use the word occupation, which uh, it wouldn't get you fired from the Israeli cabinet. So I don't see why it should get you into trouble yeah, on this program. And I think, I think they are. Look, I, I think the, the, the way it has been, for anyone that's been following this conflict for a while, I mean, Gaza is literally a pimple on the back of Israel that they've tried to, they've tried to subdue for a long time. They just mm. want this to be over. They want this to be done. You know, by, with now, I, you know, I know it sounds a bit macabre and a bit sinister, but I think that's what's actually going on. You know, by withdrawing this, this funding to the UN, you stop aid. Already we know that Gaza is on the, on the verge of a famine. We've already lost over 30,000 people. You know, God knows how many under the rubble. God knows how many people are going to die from infections, diseases, you know, in the next months. And I think before any kind of ruling comes from the ICJ, they just want this to be over and done with. That's why they're having these conferences talking about let's reoccupy Gaza. I mean, I'm sure they've already approved rebuilding settlements. And I think the central thing that a lot of people forget and we always need to remember is that Israel is an occupying force. It's an occupying power. 
You know, it's not it's not just Israel versus Gaza. They're two separate states. They've been occupying Gaza and they're co- constantly assaulting the West Bank. So this is just a good way just to get rid of Gaza, get rid of the Gaza problem, as they like to call it, occupy it and then deal with the West Bank. Uh, following and, that. and the attrition of that rhetoric has been extraordinary. People who in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist attack would have furiously furiously refuted any of the claims that you've just made, have gone very quiet since the turn of the new year, since the beginning of December, probably. Uh, the, the idea that there is a, a horrible subtext here, that, that Netanyahu is dedicated to what he described as a younger man, um, as, as being a desire. And, and of course, the, the liquid manifesto has contained the words from the river to the sea, although if you put them on a on, on a banner marching through London, you'll have Suella Braverman trying to throw you in jail. But if you put them on a uh, election <laughs> documentation as a member of Benjamin Netanyahu's political party, you end up prime minister. It's a funny old world, isn't it? Thank you, Gabriel. Phone lines are open. What have I got wrong? Please, God, I've got something wrong. And secondly, if I haven't, what are these countries supportive of the withdrawal of funding, taking away, in some cases, the only avenues of aid into an area where people are already starving? What is it designed to achieve? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.35 is the time. Not for, not for the first time. I probably need to review my use of the word Britain this morning. The First Minister of Scotland, Humza Youssef, has made it clear that the Scottish government has not paused or withdrawn aid to UNRWA. Um, I'm never going to get used to saying that. UNRWA is an acronym not designed for ease of speaking, isn't it? It makes everybody sound like Jonathan Ross. Um, he, he, In contrast to what the BBC had reported, uh, Youssef has uh, tweeted in the last 24 hours that um, the Scottish government has not paused or withdrawn aid. We have previously provided as much as we can within our financial constraints, about, I think, £750,000. Um, in two separate installments last year. Um, America, meanwhile, pays by far the biggest amount of money after uh, Joe Biden restored it, but it is still just $340 million. And while we're collecting statistics, I should remind you that more than 150 United Nations employees have been killed so far in the attacks on Gaza. I'll say that again. 150 United Nations employees have been killed so far. Twelve have been accused of taking part in the October the 7th attack on southern Israel. Israel, meanwhile, has been found to be plausibly engaged in genocide by the International Court of Justice in The Hague. So make sense of this for me. The Palestinians are being punished. Every Palestinian in Gaza is being punished for the, for the existence of allegations against 12 members of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. Jeannie's in Loughborough. Jeannie, what would you like to say? Um, good morning, James. Hello. I, I believe that it has achieved the greatest PR coup for Israel to distract the world's attention from the charge of potential stroke plausible genocide by Israel that we heard from the ICJ. The timing is incredibly suspect. On Israel's part, I believe they're saying we can reduce bombing, we can just starve them out. It is an absolute disgrace for all the nine governments. It is the lowest that our UK government has ever sunk with regards to morality, integrity or leadership. And just finally in closing, (laughs) we need to understand that as far as I know, the alleged information gained, which has summarily dismissed these Palestinians without investigation, without charge, was gained potentially by torture, which would be in total opposition to every law of the land or on this earth. It is cynical, it is unethical, it is evil, and I think our government should hang their head in shame. What do you think their hope is? If, if in the highly unlikely event of Rishi Sunak talking to proper journalists about this instead of about banning vapes for children today... You say, what's the plan? What is it designed to achieve? What do you think he would say? Well, I think it, they have said that they stand with Israel, and I think we will fall with Israel as well, unfortunately. Mm. But I also believe that when the ICJ has made it clear that within three weeks or less by now, that Israel is to report back on how they have met the regulations, especially to increase aid 
to the refugees. What will Israel's excuse be? Well, the world community has reduced our age, the, the age coming in, so we're doing the best we can. Good God, I hadn't so thought of that. we are complicit, totally complicit. It is a disgrace. We have sat by and watched children being murdered, blown to bits, and we say that we're a Christian country and we endorse it. How would Rishi Sunak feel if one of those children happened to be his? He's a father, he has a wife. How would he feel if this was happening to him? It is an absolute disgrace. It makes me ashamed, absolutely ashamed, not just of our lack of humanity, but our lack of moral high ground and conscience. Well, you speak, of course, of a government that is in some corners, or, or at least of a governing party that has plenty of people dedicated to withdrawal from the European Convention on, on human rights, which I think is one of the safeguards against uh, torture or, or evidence gleaned through torture. I have read that accusation. I haven't read any proof of it, Jeannie, and, and I'm pretty confident you have either, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to put it into the mix, um, just as indeed the plausibility of genocide being committed by Israel has been established by the International Court of Justice. Um, this is probably the most extraordinary element of the whole story for me at the moment, and I, I, I want to read you some words from Una Hathaway, who's a professor at Yale Law School and the director of that school's Centre for Global Legal Challenges, a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, speaking to The New Yorker at the weekend. Um, she said, I think what this decision is saying is that Israel has engaged in acts that could plausibly constitute violations of the Genocide Convention, both genocidal acts and perhaps incitement to genocide, and that there's enough here that's been alleged that those allegations are plausible. So they haven't found that genocide has necessarily taken place, but the situation is dire enough that it is necessary for the court to issue these provisional measures. So it's a pretty big blockbuster, I think, because the court is finding that Israel, which of course is a state that was created after World War II for the protection of those who had been subject to the horrors of the Holocaust, is the subject of plausible claims that it is in violation of the Genocide Convention, which was a convention that in large part was created for the purposes of condemning and attempting to prevent genocides like the Holocaust from ever happening again. So this is a momentous decision. 12 allegations against 12 members of a 13,000 strong workforce. We can, uh, for the ease of argument, we can describe them as plausible. They are plausible allegations. Indeed, some people have already been fired without trial, without investigation and, and without evidence. They have been fired. And yet, it's the 2.2 million Palestinians who are facing further punishment today, and not the people whose regime has been found to be plausibly engaged in violations of the Genocide Convention. I don't know that anybody can make sense of this in a way that is uh, less bleak than the analyses we've heard so far. But I stress again, you are welcome to try. 10.42 is the time. Hassan is in Kensington. Hassan, what would you like to say? Look, um, I think the past few callers have been extremely articulate. And uh, the, look, the short term, they want to uh, Israelis want to distract us from the ICJ judgment. And I think the long term plans are to destroy UNRWA and this entire sort of continued refugee status for the Palestinians. And I'm really glad you mentioned that Israeli female administrator who did the speech. No, 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 no Garabel, a former Israeli yeah. official. I don't precisely yeah. know her um, yeah. history, but her, she said our main goal in the war is to uh, eliminate the threat and not to neutralize it. And we know how to eliminate terrorists. It is more difficult for us with an idea. UNRWA is the source of the idea. So she's calling for the um, uh, destruction of UNRWA and, and yeah, says exactly. it must begin immediately. And here we are, less than a month later, arguably seeing some of the early stages of the destruction of that agency. Yeah. I think absolutely, James, and I'm glad you're uh, having this discussion, but I think our focus must remain on the ICJ judgment, where literally 16-1, 15-2 of the judges, and these were U.S., German, French, Australian judges, right, mm. uh, who came out against, uh, even the Israeli judge joined in that uh, genocidal statements need to be punished. Yes. And uh, and, and then what does Smotrich and uh, ben Gavir do? They show up at this a reoccupation conference where they talk about voluntary migration, which yeah. then uh, Israeli uh, communication minister accepts that this is actually coerced migration, i.e. ethnic cleansing, where you destroy people's homes and then say, can you voluntarily, voluntarily migrate somewhere else now? 
Um, and I think that is what our sh- focus should be. And I think uh, we should... Uh, make this is for people who don't know. This was a conference dedicated to what is described as the resettlement of Gaza. Um, a drive for reoccupation and resettlement in in in, in the Gaza Strip, uh, uh, and uh, some reports had up to a dozen ministers and fifteen members yeah. of the Knesset in attendance at this at this conference. Yeah, twelve out of thirty-seven ministers, right? One third of the cabinet was there, and I think our focus or our, our government's focus should be. I mean, we should try and make sure that we are not participating in this genocide by uh, plausible genocide by supplying arms and equipment to the Israeli government. And I think what is also interesting is, look, Trump cut off UNRWA aid, but he had so much, he lacked legitimacy so much that other countries did not follow him. In this case, Biden has can, uh, has blocked and eight, seven other countries have joined in. So it's again shocking that somebody so ridiculous as Trump was actually, uh, Biden is turning out to be even worse than Trump on the on the Gaza and Israel situation, because he moves when, when he me. when he moves people follow. I think we need to to remind ourselves that Trump took the decision in absentia of any allegations of of, of terrorism <laughs> against <laughs> members of UNRWA staff, and, and Biden has yeah. not. It might it might be a a bit of a fig yeah. leaf, but I, I think it's important to put it out there. And and I, I sus- suspect you would agree with this that the defunding makes it almost impossible for the ICJ orders to be implemented. No, absolutely. I mean, this is literally a life sign for 2.2 million Gazans who are facing starvation, who are facing incredible injuries, who are have had their entire sort of infrastructure of health and supply disrupted. And is this the time to actually cut off funding for this organisation? It's extraordinary. The more we talk about it, the more extraordinary it appears to be. And in the absence of any substantive answer to the question of what they're hoping to achieve, um, it becomes it becomes ever bleaker. Hassan, I'm a little late for the break. I, 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 this conversation is desperately important, not least because elements of the UK media will be keen that you don't understand what is going on and, and, and keen to in, engage in provocations and, um, and, and trivialities while completely ignoring the reality of famine now uh, facing Gaza as a consequence in part of British government policy. I, I'll say that again. A British government policy rendering, in the words of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, rendering famine inevitable in Gaza, where 25,000 people have already been killed by a regime that the International Court of Justice has found to have been plausibly in contravention of the Genocide Convention. I, I, I mean, you must know, and I know it's my job to get my head around some of this stuff, and sometimes I fail. But it's 10.47 now, and I don't know that anybody can offer up a, a single scintilla of opposition or contradiction to, to, to what we are describing. The phone lines are open, 0345 606973. And I, I, historically, there is never any shortage of people, people with whom I often have enormous sympathy. There is never any shortage of people keen to defend any act by Israel or any international act in support of Israel. I have to tell you, it's not happening today. And and I'd, I'd be keen to redress that. I'd love to know what defense sounds like, looks like. Um, I'd love to. The number is 0345 1048 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.51 is the time. Um, it, it is, I think, worth having a, a, a proper look at these words in the Knesset on January the 4th um, because it, it possibly makes sense of what is happening now, whether it's the intention of Western governments or not. Uh, this former Israeli official, Nogar Arbel, talks about how the regime knows how to eliminate terrorists, but it is more difficult for us with an idea. UNRWA is the source of the idea. The idea is that more and more terrorists are born in all kinds of methods, and it will be impossible to win the war if we do not destroy UNRWA. And this destruction must begin immediately. It is not relevant to talk about the day after. The day is now. We must act to deal with these threats completely or that we will miss the opportunity window, as we have already done here several times. And, and the idea that she describes is, is the idea that Palestinian people in, uh, in Gaza, but also in, in many other places as well, are refugees. And as long as that 
situation is sustained, the rhetoric, the, the, the ideology on display here seems to be that the, the, the quotes, war, end quotes, will never be over. Um, and today's phone in has been extraordinary in the sense of consensus. Um, and I would like to see that consensus challenged. I really, good, well, really, really would. But if it isn't, ah, it's hard not to draw conclusions, isn't it? Chris is in Paddington. Chris, what would you like to say? Well, as the former UNRWA spokesman from 2007 to the beginning of 2020, I would like to make several very Crikey. brief points. Now, well, that, so, I, I, just to clarify, I'd spokesman in Gaza for, for UNRWA. Well, I, I was a spokesman for the whole of UNRWA. UNRWA okay. works in Syria, the West Bank, Jordan, Lebanon, <clears throat> excuse me, in Gaza. So I spoke for Gaza, indeed, and I went there many, many times. And the places which are now under these 2,000 pound, bomb, 2000 pound bombs, I've, I've been in many of these places. And I've heard it was my job to deal with the sorts of accusations that you've been discussing, James, on okay. your programme about the UNRWA well, workers, take, take Take your time then, Chris, please. Well, the first point I'd like to make is that UNRWA is implementing a zero-tolerance policy and always has done, I saw it from the inside, against these infringements of neutrality. So before the UN investigation being handled by the Office of Internal Oversight in New York has even finished its investigation, UNRWA has sacked these workers. Nine of them have been, are alive, they've been sacked. Um, one is dead and two are missing, um, we believe. That is the equivalent, James, of an enemy of you coming to LBC and saying, I've got some information about James O'Brien. He's been colluding with terrorists and um, we want you to sack him and LBC sacks you. So UNRWA has... Opened and and stop paying everybody else on the payroll as well. They'd, they'd stop paying Nick Ferrari, they'd stop paying Ian Dale. Everyone else would stop getting paid after I was sacked. And all your listeners as well, the people, the beneficiaries, as it were, who were <laughs> benefiting from programmes like yours, yes. And let's make no mistake, and it's a good point, um, not only is UNRWA, um, uh, uh, has UNRWA taken this very robust action, opening itself up to compensation um, claims, um, let us be clear, the British government and others seem to be supporting this, because one has to ask the question of the British government, what do you want to achieve, given that the staff members have been sacked, even before there's an internal investigation, if that comes back and says, yes, they were doing this, are you going to, well, where does that leave your aid? Yes. There's no answer to the question. It's poor donorship on behalf of Britain. It's not made it clear to UNRWA what it's got to do to get this aid reinstated. And to be clear, uh, aid from Britain to UNRWA in 2018 was 70 million, and last year it was near 20. Right. <laughs> it's already been massively reduced. Yes. So, so there's that, sh that issue. It is punitive and disproportionate. And I say it's punitive, James, because... I've been to those food distribution centres. It's the women coming in with their suckling babies, the newborn. It's the sick. It's the elderly. It's the dying. It's the wounded. It's the children with 90% burns who are gasping their last gasp. Those are the people who are going to be punished by this British decision. It's immoral. It's a disgrace. And it should be reversed. Can, and, can you... Sorry, I, I, no, that's very mm -hmm. powerful. Um, uh, and pretty unequivocal, which possibly makes a mockery of my next question. C can you rationalise it? Because none of us have managed to so far. What what are they hoping to achieve? I, I, I suppose the most obvious answer is they are in lockstep with whatever America does. Um, yeah, but I mean, how do you rationalise the irrational? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, what what is happening is that um, I think Britain is marching to America's tune. Yes. I think there is huge pressure from the Israelis. This is all on the front page of the New York Times this morning. And guess what? They leaked it the day after an ICJ decision which found that Israel, there was, there was plausible evidence yes. that Israel was basically a genocide suspect on parole. That's effective, as you say, the country, the, the grouping for whom the word genocide was created, who just lived through the appalling um, events of the Second World War, that the, the, that now, those people, that country, they now stand accused of perpetrating those very things. Now, that's a very Pla serious plausibly thing. accused. Just, just to plausibly, clarify, yeah, that, that wasn't my that wasn't my analysis. That was Una Hathaway, a yeah, professor yeah, no, 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 at Yale yeah, Law that's School. What the court, in the... That's what the court absolutely yeah. um, said. So, so yes, it's very hard to rationalise this. But the other point I'd like to make is we've all had our hearts broken by the kibbutz Nakim, the people on the kibbutzim near yes. Gaza. Um, and you know what's happened is it appears that if Israel had this information three and a half months ago, 
Those people in those kibbutzim have been denied accountability, while Israel allegedly, I don't know if this is what they've done, but I imagine they've had this information that's been around on social media for a very long time. They've withheld that from the UN to do a proper investigation to get justice and accountability for those poor souls in those kibbutzim in order to do some news management, cynical news management, the day after this and this, this decision by the ICJ. They come out with it in order to knock the headlines about genocide off the front pages. It's, if that's what's happened, if Israel has had this information for three and a half months, it's cynical news manipulation to protect the likes of Benjamin Netanyahu, who, as we heard in the court two weeks ago, was inciting genocide. He talked about the Amalek uh, genocide. He invoked it, which is in, the, in the, I think it's the first or the second book of Samuel, in which God tells Saul to go and kill the Amaleks, all children, all babies, all cattle even. It's pure genocide. And we had pictures in the ICJ court of not just Benjamin Netanyahu saying this, we had then cut to video of IDF soldiers on the ground celebrating the Amalek genocide. There was a clear link between the leadership of the army and the army on the ground doing this. It's appalling. It's, it's, it's shocking. As you say, how do you rationalize well, something so extraordinary? And I, I'm afraid to say that when you look at what the British government is doing in punishing the agency, I mean, the other important point, sorry to... No, to, carry to on. I said, take your t- I said take your time. <laughs> 13,000 UNRWA staff today. These yeah. were 12 bad apples. The, the, the 13,000 staff, I'm speaking to them in Gaza all the time. They are appalled by this. 152 of them have been killed. And in spite of that, this is, this is their finest hour, frankly. They are determined to carry on delivering humanitarian services to some of the most desperate people in the Middle East. And they are as revolted by these accusations, if they're true, as the rest of us are. That is the agency with Rishi Sunak and, and the government has decided to punish. It is immoral and it is unconscionable. I, I mean, in conclusion, Chris... Uh, you've used the word cynical a lot to describe news manipulation. Cynical, but successful. I'm afraid to say it is. I mean, how much time have you de- dedicated to it on your programme on LBC mm. today? Um, yes, it's inevitable. It's a story of the day, and journalists have to cover it. And by the way, let me absolutely say, I have no proof that Israel has held on to this information for three and a half months. I'm saying if that is true, and it'd be very interesting to ask Mark Regev and the other people who come on your programme, how long has Israel had this information? And why did it come out with it the day after um, that it was, you know, it, it came up after the, 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 the indictments that we heard in the ICJ? Why is that? Because if it is, the, they have been holding on to it. It's denied justice. It's delayed justice and accountability for those poor people in that, in that kibbutz. And it's also, frankly, news manipulation, which is appalling. Well, there's a, there, appalling. There, yeah, there is a difference, I suppose, between reflecting the reality of, 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 of the story and wading in um, wholeheartedly on, on, on the side of the decision to withdraw the funding, which is morally and, and philosophically and ethically, I, I would argue now, particularly having heard from you, uh, completely unsustainable. But we're, we're not talking about journalists who, who share their thinking, really, just just, the, just their conclusions. Chris, I, I've now realised Chris Gannett, um, former UNRWA spokesman uh, from 20, 2007 to 2020. Thank you for that. Um, it didn't exactly constitute a challenge to the consensus, though, did it? Confusion about what the UK and eight, nine other countries are hoping to achieve by withdrawing this on a, on a logistical level. What, what is the end game? What is the aim of this? But on a moral or ethical level, how can punishing 13,000 UN workers, of whom 150 have already been killed, or indeed punishing all 0.2.2 million Palestinians, how can that possibly be a reasonable, fair moral response to the allegation, the plausible allegation, we could say, that 12 members of, of UNRWA staff were involved in the October the 7th terror attacks. I don't think anybody can really make sense of that. But you're welcome to try. It's 11.01. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 11 is the time, and it's, it's a, a sort of... A sense, isn't it? A growing sense of escalation in the Middle East. I heard Jeremy Bowen, the veteran BBC foreign correspondent, describing without really pausing today the impossibility of extricating the um, extricating individual acts 
uh, th these wars, or these conflicts bubbling away constantly, and then flashpoints occur. But uh, the idea that you can separate them from the conflict in in Gaza, from the continuing bar bombardment of, of Gaza, uh, is is absurd. And it was quite refreshing to hear a brilliant journalist just just describe reality. I, I, we did work out last week why politicians, and this includes both Sunak and Starmer, were so keen to claim that the attacks on Houthi positions had nothing to do with what was going on in in Gaza. And it is just about sustainable intellectually. Uh, you know, we are bombing these positions because they are shooting at our ships. Full stop, end of conversation. If you continue the conversation, the question of why they are shooting at your ships becomes impossible to ignore. But if you don't continue the, the conversation, you can ignore that question. And therefore, you can claim that attacks on Houthi positions have nothing to do with what's going on in, in Gaza um, and Israel. But you can't have a more substantive, you can't have a more sophisticated conversation about anything, including the three American troops who've now been killed in a drone attack without acknowledging that the um, uh, trouble spots, for want of a, a, a heavier phrase, are inextricably intertwined. 34 US personnel hurt. And we will probably find out today what President Biden is going to do in response. So wherever you turn at the moment, uh, all roads lead to the Middle East. The Iranian-backed militias being blamed for the attack on American troops. Tehran denying involvement. Negotiations um, apparently at quite a sensitive stage over the hostages still being held by Hamas in Gaza. And, and yet the oddest, and a Labour MP, of course, suspended over uh, a, 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 an email to her constituency members describing recent genocides uh, and including Gaza on that list. I, I mean, Kate Ossimore coming in for predictable uh, uh, criticism over this and probably predictable punishment from her party. But all, all she had to do to insulate herself from any controversy would be to insert the word plausible before the word Gaza. Um, because that is the finding of the International Court of Justice. Incredibly silly of her, in my opinion, not to do so. If you really need to include Gaza in a, a list of genocides, then you have to abide by the finding of the International Court of Justice and describe it merely as a plausible genocide. Um, and she didn't do that. Uh, and accordingly, she is being, uh, she has had her whip suspended. Um, and, and I mentioned the negotiations that are ongoing as well with in, in Qatar, likely to, to achieve success. And yet, of course, I think we've seen another shift. This is a CIA boss uh, in uh, ceasefire talks with Israeli and Qatari spy chiefs, um, uh, possible ceasefire and hostage exchange. William Burns, Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani and the prime minister of Qatar. He is the prime minister of Qatar and, and a Mossad chief as well, meeting in Paris ahead of a, a possible deal. But, um, you know, uh, what would that do to governments that have failed so far to support calls for a ceasefire? Nothing substantive on the ground has changed, except the death toll of Palestinians continues to climb. Uh, and now you come to the difficulty that Israel will have in abiding by the International Court of Justice's order that they report back on what they've done to... Uh, reduce the plausibility of a genocide finding that I would argue has become almost impossible as a consequence of the defunding of, of UNRWA. But on we go. So I, I continue this conversation. I'm not sure how long for. I want to free up a couple of phone lines because I want to say something that you might not like. And if there were a hierarchy of sympathy, then obviously the people facing the most urgent likelihood of death and starvation would be at the top of it for all objective people or, or moral people uh, you, you show me two suffering humans i will muster more two suffering innocent humans and i will muster more sympathy for the one suffering more uh, you show me you know uh, two populations uh, who are suffering innocent populations and i will muster more sympathy for the one that's suffering more uh, what's difficult in matters Middle Eastern, of course, is that there's a zero-sum game in play where people are keen to argue that if you feel sympathy for one side, then you can't possibly feel any sympathy for the other. But I feel very sorry for, for, for Israelis today, and I want to explain why. I, I, I feel very sorry that you've been put in a position of being required to either stay silent or defend the indefensible. And I don't think it's your fault. 
I really don't. I, I, I've spoken many, many times about generational trauma and about the, 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 the phantom of persecution, the omnipresent phantom of persecution that Jewish people have lived with for millennia, really, and the incredible status that Israel has therefore assumed in the, in the collective memory, the collective consciousness of Jewish people, regardless of where they live in the world. Israel is the haven. It's the place you go when the pogroms start or when the next Holocaust comes around. And as a consequence of that, the relationship between citizen and government has been, to my mind, unique in, in recent history. Uh, the idea that that gives citizens perfectly plausible, that's a word we're using a lot today, perfectly plausible reasons for supporting anything the government does in, in pursuit of defending that haven. But I have a sense this morning, I have done for a while actually, but I have a sense this morning that you can't really justify this. And that's why I feel very sorry for you because you, you have been boxed into this position by um, events really and by, I, I, I think, some profoundly questionable politicians. I'm Netanyahu's plight both both criminal and ethical, is fairly well documented, but probably not that well understood outside Israel. But you've been boxed into a position now where you are desperately searching around for reasons to support the withdrawal of aid for 2.2 million Palestinians after a dozen people were alleged to be involved in the terrorist atrocity of October the 7th. And I genuinely don't see how you can. I, I, I mean... That question has hardened for me, speaking to Chris Gunnis a moment ago, who was the UNRWA spokesman uh, for, for 13 years. I like this. from uh, It's unsigned. Without wanting to make light of anything, James, how the hell did that guy not get a Ray Liotta? It was a text that a few texts came. I can, if you think I'm going to drop a Ray Liotta into a conversation like this one, then you're, you're even dafter than I look. Um, Leon, um, in response to similar exchanges, says, how is it that the people who call into your show are more informed than most journalists? Um, uh, well, the answer is that they probably pay a little bit more attention because they have skin in the game in many cases, um, is the short answer. Although, to contrast that, Moss in Wood Green says, James, you are quite different from all the other LBC presenters. Have you considered working for Al Jazeera? Um, well, Moss, you're the kind of person I want to ring in, really, because we've done an hour and 12 minutes now of conversation with fairly straightforward questions. What, what is the aim of withdrawing aid from 2.2 million Palestinians? Is it fair to do so as a punishment for the alleged actions of 12 members of a 13,000 strong workforce and why is it uh, essentially drawing attention away from the International Court of Justice's finding that Israel is plausibly engaged in genocide? Those are, there's no opinion there, mate. Those are all questions based on facts. And if you can't answer them, then that's a you problem, not a me problem, mate. But you know that already. And that's why I feel sorry for people who have historically or traditionally found themselves very powerfully and passionately defending almost anything that Israel has done. I, I, I have defended things that Israel has done that to the, to the great annoyance of other people that listen to the program. But I'm not defending this. And nor are you. The difference, I suppose, is complicity. So you've defended everything up until this point and now you, now you can't. It's kind of your fault we got here, isn't it? And that's why I feel sorry for you, because that must be a great moral weight, a great psychic toll. And I, and I speak of people possessed of consciences, of course. Possessed of consciences. And there are plenty of people on both sides of this debate who don't have consciences. I think that, that is clear. Or at least they don't have a, an understanding of the extension of conscious, conscience to all people. Which brings us back to where I began this little <laughs> contemplation, which is the, the notion of a, of a hierarchy of sympathy. I feel sorrier for someone with a broken leg than I do for someone with a broken finger. But I still feel sorry for the person with the broken finger. So I'm not suggesting that my sympathy for Israelis today is on anything like my sympathy for Palestinian people in Gaza at this point in history, but it doesn't mean I can't have sympathy. And, uh, and I won't let anybody tell me that I shouldn't. Okay? Um... The number you need to join in this conversation, 03456060973.
is the number you need. What is it designed to achieve? And how can anyone possibly think that it's fair? It's 11.15. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. And um, I, I, the questions remain the same, really. How can anybody think this is fair? How, how is it not collective punishment? But even if you're comfortable with collective punishment, um, what's it designed to achieve? What's it designed to achieve? It is a really good illustration of what I meant when I talked about having sympathy for Jewish people in general, but it's supporters of the Israeli government, perhaps in historical, traditional supporters of the Israeli government in particular. So Mark has texted to say, one side wants the other not to exist or be alive, and it's not Israel. I, well, yeah, if you're talking about Hamas, I used to agree with that, actually, but I can't anymore. Why should I take the, the words of some of the members of the Likud cabinet less seriously than the words of, of Hamas? That's the problem, Mark, is I, I used to read texts like that and think, oh, crikey, do I need to slightly recalibrate my approach to this subject? Because clearly Hamas are dedicated to the destruction of the state of Israel. But I don't think you can argue now that there aren't members of the Israeli cabinet who aren't dedicated to the destruction of um, a Palestinian homeland or the land of Gaza or whatever you prefer to call it. So that doesn't work anymore, mate. And that's what I mean when I talk about sympathy. That, that used to be a a trump card in conversations like this, but it isn't anymore because of people that Benjamin Netanyahu has brought into government and therefore into the international public eye, uh, saying even this weekend utterly unconscionable things, which I'm afraid give the lie to the idea that there's nobody on that side that doesn't want the other side to exist or, or, or even be alive, up to and including the International Court of Justice finding the allegation of genocide to be plausible. So that just doesn't work anymore. 20 minutes after 11 is the time. Mahid is in Harrow. Mahid, what would you like to say? Hi there. I mean, I echo what you were saying about the Israelis and the Jews in particular uh, being boxed in into a Zionist settler, white settler colonial project since, you know, God knows when. And I think we have to understand the historical context when we're trying to rationalise what's happening and the decision that was made by not just our government, but by others as well, which... Of course, they're following America's, you know... Yes. America is a new empire, that's it. It's not the British Empire, it's the American Empire. And, and England, Australia, Canada, they all follow suit. And when you look at the context, the historical context, even in our recent time about Black Lives Matter, Islamophobia, all of these things have largely gone unchecked. There's been a lot of lip service, but nothing really has happened. And when you look at the plight of the Palestinians, it is a... There is a white, you know, Arab, you know cross there you know palestinian lives have been dehumanized and when you look at the fact that it is you know we can all say that it is plausible mm. according to the international court of justice that you know genocide has uh, been happening and there's been very very strong genocidal rhetoric coming out of uh, the uh, israeli government Mem now, mem members, members of members of the israeli members government. of them yes mem but, but, but that's a finding you know, of the court of, that's a finding of the international court that's just yes. counting that's not an opinion but when you look but when you look at the fact that allegations versus plausibility that has been confirmed in the international court allegations that are being uh, you know checked by the un and when you look at the fact that over 2 you know million people are being affected by that decision over you know 12 bad apples which, you know, yes, if they've done something wrong, justice should be served. Well, they've already but been sacked, that, of course, the ones that are still alive. So exactly, I, 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 we, we've, we've covered a lot of this ground. We've covered a lot of this ground already, and, and, and I'm conscious of moving into the second hour of the conversation. Can you explain the end game? Can you, could, have you any idea of what a positive outcome of it's this... A very cynical, it's a very cynical look, because when you look at the metrics of what makes decisions in this country, whether it's the media, whether it's government, or certain institutions... There has been very clear evidence that there has been institutional racism. There's very clear evidence oh, that you're politics not, so and So forgive me, I, I, the, the question is, it's not the one you're answering. What, what do you no, think? No, no, but I, well, I'm I, getting to that point. I am getting well, to that I'm point. I'm going to have to insist you hurry up a bit. Let me remind you the okay. question I'd like you to answer, because everything you've said so far, I've heard three or four times already this morning, out of other callers' mouths and indeed my own. So if, if Rishi Sunak was sitting in front of you now and he said, and you said to him, what, what's, the, what's the play here? What's the outcome? What's the win? What would he say? It's about reinforcing uh, 
his allies and reinforcing corporate uh, allies as well. Well, he wouldn't say that, would he? But that's the only thing that matters to him. But he wouldn't say that, would he? Uh, He's but everything that's come out of his mouth has been. He doesn't want to make any comments on when there's a. Why are Why are you doing this? What is the positive What is the positive ramification of this policy? What could he say? What would he say? There's no justification for it, but his justification is he's maintaining his corporate uh, alliances and his uh, political alliances. And at the moment, that's all driven by America. It's as simple as that. And he's completely ignoring what the, you know, even if you look at, say, what you benefit from the uh, Arab uh, uh, alliances, because the Arab countries don't care enough. For them, money is more important. The treaties are more important. They want to get on with their life. And but again, so, that's why I'm interested in the in the theoretical question of what, what they would say. I mean, he'll have to say something at some point that, that doesn't fit the narrative that you describe. Um, and, and I don't know what that answer would look like or sound like at the moment. 24 minutes after 11 is the time, particularly in the context of the thing that they all seem desperate for us not to talk about, which is the extraordinary historical finding of the International Court of Justice in The Hague on Friday. It's 24 minutes after... 11. Um, Eater is in Edinburgh. Eater, what would you like to say? Oh, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for feeling sorry for me that I have to uh, defend the uh, um, no, actions I, I, of the I, I, of Israel. It's, it's, it's the people who recognise that the actions have become indefensible, I feel sorry for. Right, OK. So that, I don't think um, that is you, is it? Um, well, we'll see. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to say something about uh, UNRWA, the... the uh, United Nations Agency for, for specifically for Palestinian refugees. Um, the the thing is that you talk about the twelve people that Israel uh, said participated in the massacre of the seventh of October. Yes, but this might be just the tip of the iceberg, because uh, or, or they might no, not, or they might not have participated. No, no, there there are there are uh, uh, testimonies from uh, hostages that were released who said that they were um, moved from one place to another which which, which would be offered up as e- which which, which would vehicles. be which would be offered up as evidence in an investigation or a trial it certainly wouldn't yeah. be it would never so, be taken as a verdict would it the thing is that you talk about what was told to you about these 12 people who actually participated in the massacre no nothing nothing nothing's, nothing's, nothing's been told to me nothing's been told to me I, I may need to remind you of the questions that we're actually asking but before i do that right. i'll I'll just quote the White House National Security Advisor on this, who, who has pointed out that the violations, the alleged violations of a handful of staff, quotes, should not impugn the entire agency, which he added had, quotes, helped save literally thousands of lives in Gaza. They do important work. You, of course, have the right to impugn the entire agency. That's fine. But the question is, what do you think the plan is? What do you think the aim of the withdrawal of funding is, Eta? I, I think that uh, uh, this is a good time for the world to uh, correct... Uh, mistake that was done many years ago uh, and instead of the UN having two refugee agencies one specifically for Palestinians and one for the rest of the world just absolve this uh, UNRWA and uh, make the UNHCR I think if I'm not mistaken um, the one agency that actually takes care of all the refugees in the world and while they're at it uh, change the status of refugees uh, from this special um, status that Palestinian refugees have, where they can um, give their refugee status to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, and in in, in perpetuity, and uh, just you know, if you're a refugee like my grandfather was, my both grandfathers, one from Iran and one from Germany, um, and you know they were refugees. They made it to Palestine, later became Israel, and that's where it ended. My parents weren't refugees. I'm not a refugee. Because and, because know, they have a homeland? No. I mean, I have family in, in Canada and in uh, Australia. And, but they also uh, have a homeland. Other places. Yes, they all have a homeland. Whereas Palestinian people don't. Isn't that the distinction, as I understand what, it? Sorry, and so as you said yourself, you, you said the UK and the US. You said yourself that your four, you said yourself that your forebears went back, and and when Palestinian people can go back, then I think the case for no, no, removing their status my, my, would, would be stronger. I'm, anyway, the point my that my grandfather could not go back to Iran, 
And my other grandfather had nothing to go back to in Germany. So, you know, they were refugees and they were... Uh, uh, but they have a homeland. I mean, Israel. this is why Israel yeah. exists, to create a homeland yeah. for, for people who were dis for yeah. Jewish people who were dispossessed. So why, there is why, no... Why is, Jordan, why is Jordan not the homeland of Palestinians? You, you, well, I've, I've seen one Israeli politician speaking beside a, a map of greater Israel that dispensed with the existence of Jordan altogether. So part of the answer to your question okay. probably probably so lies in that take, observation. Okay, so and and, and he's a member of the Israeli government. But listen, I, I think you may have got the wrong end of the stick. I think you're right. I, I think right. that I think that the aim, certainly the aim of Israel, is to is to destroy UNRWA and to yes, and to absolutely. remove and to remove because the refugee UNRWA, status of the Palestinian people. I think you're absolutely right. You need, you need to remember that UNRWA is not just these these people who hand out uh, food. They're also teachers in all the schools in in the. Yes, Gaza down with down with that and, sort of thing. And you need to ask yourself. And medical. Don't forget the what, medical facilities. We don't want them either. What are they teaching? Yes. In these schools. Well, I don't need to ask myself that. Is it that. possible we, we can, that they're we can... teaching that all the Jews are evil and oh, they need to be destroyed? Is it possible that 200 Israelis are currently standing at one of the few areas where aid can get into Gaza, trying to stop the trucks from going through? They are families of hostages that say, if we don't hear from, we don't get a, a, a light. A, but a that puts them in. From, that puts them in direct members. contravention of the International Court of Justice's instructions okay. on Friday. All right. And, and, but again, and I think I think you're right. I, I, I think you're right. I, you know, I think that it is designed to remove special status from these people. Um, however, many of them are left when the bombardment is over. I think you're absolutely right. I don't know why you thought I would disagree with you. All right. That's the plan, isn't it? Um, I, I rob, rob, so. rob them I, of their special refugee status and destroy the only why, agency. Why are they, destroy why are the they only agency dedicated and, dedicated and like to helping them. We're, we're regular refugees. Well, you'd have to ask why what you'd have to ask what freedom other agencies would have to get in and out of Gaza at the moment, wouldn't you? Well, right now, a truck that goes into Gaza is immediately taken over by. Uh, Hamas yeah, well, right now, it can't get in, can it? At calm, uh, at calm Abu Shalom, because the Israeli people are blocking well, the trucks well, carrying yeah. carrying humanitarian aid into the area. But I say again, I agree with you. I think that is absolutely the plan: get rid of the agency that's helping them, and r d deprive them or, or, or denude them of their refugee status, despite the fact that, unlike you, um, these people do not have a, 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 a sovereign homeland anywhere in the world. Um, hundred percent agree. Half past eleven is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Eleven thirty-four is the time. Well, I thought we were going to be talking about vapes this morning, uh, and we probably will in the in the final hour of the program. But this is it's a very sad conversation. Um, the the idea that the withdrawal of aid from or one of the only sources of aid the withdrawal of funding for one of the only sources of aid in Gaza has achieved the support of our own government for reasons that are not clear. Uh, the rationale given for it is allegations of involvement in the October the 7th terror attack upon Israel by Hamas that have been levelled at so far about a dozen members of the United Nations, the United Nations Agency workforce, a workforce that runs into the 13 plus thousand, 13,000 plus. And, and, I, and I cannot make sense of it, except under ITA's contribution, which is that it is, I know what Israel's plan is. I'm surprised that the British, and I don't actually think the British government are going along with it. I'm not sure Rishi Sunak, if he was sitting here now, could offer up a really detailed explanation of why they are complicit in causing famine under one expert analysis of the situation. I really don't think he could, but I think for a certain brand of Israeli ideology, the idea of removing the uh, special status, if you like, of Palestinian refugees is, is key to the broader project. And getting rid of the United Nations agency dedicated to Palestinian refugees would be crucial to that. Um, there's a rather good tweet here um, that, that, that puts it very well from Shakaf who says any other refugee in the world, like many in the UK, for example, receive permanent status in the countries they are in. Only Palestinians are still considered refugees three generations after their grandparents were relocated from what now is Israel. I, I mean, relocated is a bit of a euphemism in, in, in many of those cases, but we'll let that pass. UNWA is providing education to those dependents of refugees, teaching them that they have the right to return to Jaffa, to Haifa or to Galilee. No other refugee group in the world 
can claim their right of return 75 years after they've been expelled from their homes. For 75 years, the Palestinians rely on international support instead of solving the refugees' problem. If the refugees' problem was to be solved tomorrow, UNRWA would be dissolved. And as any organization, they first and foremost deal with self-preservation. So uh, this is the point, I think, that Ita was making. Another note, mentioning the idiot Israeli politicians, especially the likes of Smotrich and Ben Gavir, as representing the entirety of Israel, is similar to saying Enoch Powell represents the UK policy. Well, then surely, under that reading, representing the 12, quote, idiots, end quotes, accused of being involved in the October the 7th terror attacks as representing the entirety of UNRWA um, would be even worse behavior with, with, with even worse consequences. And these are members of government. These are not like uh, random eccentric MPs or, 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 or politicians on the fringes of a governing party. These are people in the cabinet. So... I don't think some of that analysis works, but I do understand better the sober dedication to the belief that UNRWA is not a force for good because it perpetuates the refugee status of Palestinian people, to which I think my homeland point speaks pretty directly. Cease to be a refugee when you have a homeland. If you don't have a homeland, you are in a state of perpetual refugee-ness. For, for one, which is something that I, I would have applied to Jewish people prior to 1948, actually, the same definition. Tanya's in Harrow. Tanya, what would you like to say? Um, well, I think the, what Lucy Sunat will actually say will be that we're not cutting aid at the moment, we're just suspending it mm. until we can do further investigation. And, until we and can what? Really... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, the line's not great. Until We're suspending it until... Until we uh, we can until further investigation. Okay. Until, you know, we, yeah. But That's they've already fired the accused, though. So what would further investigation achieve? It's a strange one, isn't it? I know, but that that is literally what if you yes. um, looked at the American politicians. That's what they've been saying. So yes. they're just going to say the same thing. But um, actually, there's something you said that I um, really resonated with, which is I'm pro-Palestinian, but I do feel a lot of sympathy for Israelis mm. after this current thing because like um i listened to the news like 24 israeli soldiers died right yes um and i thought no one is going to feel sympathy for these young men like you know outside israel no one's going to care like these people have died because they're like to them they're just perpetrators of this possible genocide and i thought that must be incredibly sad and isolating for everyone in israel to know that no one is going to care that whether you're because um, they're very young, they're like 19 year old, yes. is known for life, has died, no one is going to care. And that must be so sad, right? And then obviously, you know, the Palestinian people, when you look out, the majority of them are children that are dying, and um, uh, women and children, you you feel a more sympathy, yes. But yeah. But so not, to, not, not like, to the exclusion of sympathy for other people, even, yeah. even people involved in the in the killing of those children, in the killing of those yeah, and civilians. This is just going to make it worse. Because the well, that's, that's that the like, bit that we come back to. And actually, we haven't come to it yet today. Is the question, the abiding question of how any of this will possibly make things better in well, the future. Well, the reason I feel like they're doing it, yeah, is if you see the, the actual, at The Hague, South Africa used majority of the evidence from the UN. So it's on in the court saying that these are your bodies that are saying this. Yes. And then in the decision, the American judge, she specifically mentioned all the UN agencies, right? Yes. And so right now, the only UN agency that can get aid into Gaza is UNRWA, right? So now you, if you put doubt into that whole transport system, you have to stop it. You can't get, uh, there's no way that aid is coming in. Like, I can donate, but where, how is it going to get in other than this agency? So I think this is the reason why they're attacking it, because it's attacking the fundamental of this agency is part of UN. So if this is corrupt, then that means that all the other ones are corrupt. And then it's just going to make it more worse and more isolating. And then no one is, it's like, I, I know I don't want to compare it, yeah, but no one, uh, like there's a saying, I remember saying, no one says there's a sympathetic Nazi. They're all the same, right? And I, it must be really devastating to know that. No you're one doing a, you're, the you're, I mean, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that word appearing in the context of this conversation. But I, I, you're, 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 you're speaking to the sort of not in my name 
school of thought, I think. No, no, I, I don't want to make the, the like that, but I just want to say No, that, I, I know, understand. I just don't like that word in the context of this conversation. I think it's really yeah. unhelpful. But I do. Yeah, I, but, but I know you're not yeah. drawing a direct parallel. You're just talking about situations in history when a whole population is considered complicit in the actions of a government, when clearly lots of people in that population would not be supportive of that government. What I found interesting today is how hard it is to find people who are supportive and everyone who is will be like Ita in, in Manchester essentially calling for the dissolution of the agency that came into existence in 1949 to deal with the very specific plight of Palestinian people, about 700,000 then, Palestinian people um, uh, removed from their, their, their homes to make way for the modern state of Israel. And the, the, the idea that they retain refugee status and pass it on to children and grandchildren is a, is a thorn in the side of the state. It really is. I don't know whether I can make a powerful case for removing it, though, without completely ignoring the history. And the minute you start completely ignoring the history in any conversation about that part of the world, all bets are off. 11.42 is the time. Dina is in Cheltenham. Dina, what would you like to say? Oh, I think hello. that... Hello, Dina. What would you like to say? Um, regarding what do I think the plan is, I think um, that the Israeli government's plan was set in place from October the 7th. Um, the atrocities that happened on October 7th gave them the green light um, for their master plan of the reduction of Palestinians and ideally the complete eradication of them. And I don't use those words lightly, James. No. I think um, this has been happening for decades, for 75 years. Um, we, it's not the fourth of um, mass media in this country, which is predominantly Zionist owned, um, um, because it doesn't suit their narrative. But um, Palestinians are commonly arrested, commonly killed in the West Bank, not just Gaza. Um, and it's... No, no, the phone line keeps 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 ducking in and out. Try and try and if you can, I know it's not really fair, but if you can just I'm, make your conclusions in a couple of sentences, because I can't I can't trust this phone line, Dina. Um, I think the ultimate goal um, for Netanyahu is to continue this um, genocide program. Um, plausible, and, plausible genocide and I, program. You can't call it genocide. genocide. No, I'm Sorry, not splitting James. hairs. You can't use that word in the in in the, in the well. You have the caveat of saying that is my opinion. It's not a word. Okay, that, eradication then of okay. Palestinians, and I think he is waiting for Biden to either pop his clogs or to um, be. Um, um, ousted and wait for his buddy Donald Trump to come in and then we've got Jared Kushner pushing for Jerusalem to be made um, the new capital. For, for reasons that are even more complicated than some of the other things that pop up in this conversation. That, that, that is pandering to evangelical Christians in uh, on the right of American politics who think that when Judgment Day comes, Jews and Christians will be separated. And, and part of the preconditions for Judgment Day would be um, Jerusalem being the capital. I think I've understood this correctly. So they are no friends of the Jewish people. Uh, but I think in the last, since October the 7th, we've seen a hell of a lot of people who are no friends of the Jewish people promoting themselves as incredible champions. Um, uh, of their cause, and that well, you see that on both sides, don't you? But that would really, that would really um, give me pause. Where I'm more invested in this personally, I, I'd often, and I know people don't like this, I often swap the word Jew for the word Muslim when I look at some of the rhetoric being deployed by people who claim to be champions of Israel, and, and realise actually they're just bigots, hateful bigots who think that a vehicle towards indulging their own hateful bigotry, it, Israel can be that vehicle at the moment. And that's another reason why it's not difficult for me to muster up sympathy for everybody um, invested, personally, emotionally invested in this um, in this issue. I, 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 the, the couple of, Dina, someone's asking you for evidence, Zionist-owned media, evidence, please, other than that people might be vaguely Jewish. I, I, I don't challenge that description, um, because I don't think it does refer to the ethnicity or the religion of people that own the media. I think when people talk about Zionist-owned media, they mean media that is very, very supportive, historically and traditionally, of almost everything that, that, that Israel does in defense of its security, in, in defense of its safety. <clears throat> there are a million different definitions of that word, but um, 
But if, if you're suggesting it's Jewish-owned media that is driving this, then you are in, indulging in an anti-Semitic trope, and, I, and I, won't, I won't tolerate that for a nanosecond. 11.46 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.49. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. What, what, what a grim business this is. Um, I, and I, I think it's too serious a subject for Idiot's Corner. But um, And thank you to Laura for both picking up on this and and responding so uh, so warmly and politely to, to the, the clarification. So people who can't answer the question, really, about how it can possibly be fair to withdraw all funding from UNRWA in the circumstances in which it has, has been withdrawn. Um, uh, it, 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 just tying yourself in knots over the caller who used the phrase Zionist-owned media, which is an anti-Semitic trope, if by Zionist you mean Jewish. It's not difficult for me to say that. And and yet you, you seem to think that there's some sort of zinger or point scored. It's a, it's a disgusting trope that... Um, very popular among supporters of, of the last Labour leader. I always remember a call I took uh, when I was trying to explain why it's an anti-Semitic trope and someone rang in and just said it's not anti-Semitic because it's true. And I thought, how do you even begin to unpick that position? Like, like, you can't possibly say that it's anti-Semitic to say that the Jews control the media because they do, James. I tried. I tried my best. But uh, I, as is often the case with people who ring in with the most pungent opinions, I'm not sure they went away having uh, having seen the light. And um, something else I have done. James, I'm so grateful for your programme. Just for info, if it hasn't already been noted, the Scottish government hasn't paused or withdrawn its aid to UNRWA. It has already been noted. And also, as I noted at the time, increasingly I find myself having to clarify my use of the word Britain because the policies being pursued by Rishi Sunak's government are increasingly at odds with the policies being pursued by Humza Yousaf's. Make of that what you will. Um, 03456060973 is the number that you need if you want to have the last word on this conversation because the the clock is ticking. Sarzana is in Croydon. Sarzana, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi James. How are you? I'm pretty good. What's on your mind? <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people have covered a lot of things that I was going to say anyway, but um I was just wanted to ask the question is are we surprised? Are we surprised that they've pulled this out of the bag yet again? It's an interesting um, question, because... isn't it? But you're obviously not. I think for a, for a few hours on Friday, I thought that that might be game changing. Actually, the the you know, the international court's ruling. The more I understood it, uh, the more I thought, well, they can't gloss this one, but here we are watching them gloss it. Well, no, because bef already uh, a few days even before that, they had made it clear that they were going to. Um, I didn't mean they. By they, I didn't mean the Israeli government. I meant the British media, actually. But that's probably my obsession rather than yours. Yeah, no, but, but saying about, you know what, what, I think what's opened my eyes a lot since October the 7th is how, uh, how much the government is controlled by a certain lobby. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, the funding. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of how much funding was given to each... Um, each party and how but what um, lobby are you talking about the jewish lobby ah, well that's that's where we wave goodbye to each other i'm afraid that's another anti-semitic trope which does you or indeed the cause you profess to support no no favors whatsoever nigel farage talks a lot about the jewish lobby Susanna. do you agree with him about much else no nothing at all with well, him well just have a little pause and think about what you're hopping into bed with when you use language and tropes like that bob's in brighton bob what would you like to say Hello again, James. Right. Um, I, I called in because you had a caller on a while ago who was asking about why, why the Palestinians have, have right to uh, refugee status through yes. generations. And I just wanted to, you did a brilliant job of dealing with them, but I just wanted to flag for your listeners, you know, Palestinians have been living in refugee camps since 1953. And generations have been born, grown old and died in those camps and continue to do so. So that's why they have those rights. Um, just to move on to what you're talking well, about. Let me, well, I, I, the, I mean, the... The challenge to that would be that, so what distinguishes them from other refugees elsewhere in the world? Do, do, do you see what I mean? Why do they have I, a different status from, from refugees elsewhere in the world? I'll call her in Edinburgh, I think it was Ita, talking about his grandfather being a refugee from Iran or from Germany, and then, and then he's not a refugee by dint of his 
uh, descendants from from there. So what's the difference with Palestinian refugees and other dispossessed people um, across I mean, across the planet? That's the really complex question, James. I was, I, you, 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 you surprised me there because I wasn't expecting that follow-up. Well, it's kind of crucial. You know how this show works, Bob. That's kind of crucial to, to, to dismissing the point that he made. You have to explain to him why Palestinian people are different and that a sort of inherited refugee status applies to them in a way that it doesn't apply to other descendants of refugees all over the world. And if you can't, yeah. that's fine, but but it's no, significant. I, I, I'm happy to try. It's just, yeah, oh, there's a couple of other things I wanted to go on to before to your question. But I, I think it's to do with the, <clears throat> the complex history of the region. And, it, you know, our involvement, the, the Europe's involvement, um, this was a situation that didn't happen in a vacuum. We were involved in the, the management of Palestine uh, prior to the Balfour Declaration. We were involved in the refugee crisis that arose from the Second World War. We were implicated in, in not taking Jewish refugees. We were implicated in the moral need to create a homeland for the Jewish people. And we are similarly ongoing implicated in this very live, very ongoing um, conflict which continues to expand Israel's land and reduce the stability of the Palestinians and their ability to self-determine. And the, the, the gross, I, I think that the reason it's such a live issue and it's been going on such a long period of time is why the Palestinians have these, these special rights. Um, but I'm not an expert on that. What, no, that's if, fine. If I, and, and, and the issue of homeland is probably pertinent to it as well. The idea that you, 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 you don't have a a permanent sovereign homeland for for dispossessed Palestinian people, whereas you 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 kind of do for many other populations, but not necessarily all. So I take your point, and you're right; it's complicated. But I do want to give you time to squeeze in a couple of other points that you. Um, I'll be as quick as I can, James. And you think about Rishi Sunak's response and and and, yes. and the the pulling of um, funding uh, from this group uh, now. What we're talking about is uh, some members of this group uh, allegations against uh, a, a, a small portion of this group yes. uh, being involved in, 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 in heinous crimes. And that does need to be investigated yes, of properly. Course. However, on the other side, and, and Richie Sinek has taken the decision as a country, we are going to step back from funding all the activities of that group. Suspension, that not, not, not cessation, but I don't think it makes no. much difference in the short term, does it? The, the short term is the most crucial term, isn't it, right now, for what they do. Um, but compare that to the, 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 the ICJ's findings last Friday. We are still selling arms to Israel. That is a systematic involvement of an ally in reprehensible actions. And we are closely implicated. And if Rishi Sunak was being even-handed, he would say, yes, we were drawing funding because of these allegations against UNRWA, but we're also immediately going to stop selling arms to Israel because there's a risk of genocide and we do not want to be it, Well, the, 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 the examples of, of irreconcilable differences in, in approach and attitude, I think, are legion now. And that, and, and that is another one. So a United Nations agency getting punished collectively for the alleged actions of a tiny proportion of its workforce, while the findings of the International Court of Justice, which could not have been worse for Israel, you know, they only really had the power. There's some debate over whether they had the power to call for a ceasefire, but they literally, in these early preliminary findings, could only have decided whether or not there was enough evidence to continue investigating genocide or to conclude that there was no point continuing to investigate it because of the evidence being so poor. And they've concluded that it is plausible. They've concluded that, they yes, they absolutely are going to continue investigating the allegation, having seen so much evidence in support of it. So that it is extraordinary that that has, if you like, moved off the... Off, well, it's not extraordinary at all, but um, but it is... Uh, sad, I suppose, if you were to prioritise the things that matter most in the current context, you would think that the survival of the 2.2 million Palestinian people would be rather higher up the list of, of Western government priorities than it appears to be today. Thank you, Bob. Last word to Sarah in Birmingham. You've got about a minute, Sarah. My apologies. What would you like to say? It was just a quick one to say that Good. basically trying to justify, you know, what what the Jewish or the Israeli people might have been doing by, you know, saying that these allegations of the UN workers, you know, I've seen on social media that there's been interviewers of, um, they've interviewed protesters at the Karim Shalom border, yes. the one in the north of Gaza, and they've been trying to say, oh, we're protesting humanitarian aid coming in yes. because, um, you know, we want our hostages released so they can't get any aid until our hostages are released, which again is like collective punishment. 
So, well, it's, it, I mean, it is. I, I mean, I've mentioned that a few times today. It is. It is literally yeah. one of the things that the uh, International Court of Justice. It's a weapon of war. Basically, yes, stopping aid getting in. Aid. So you 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 yeah. can't you can't have this aid until those terrorists until over you, yeah. whom you have no influence whatsoever give up exactly. give up the hostages that many people believe the Israeli government have abandoned anyway. Thank you. You said you'd do it briefly, and you have. Um, how many Tory MPs have been sanctioned for misconduct, James? Should we suspend their funding? Meaning the entire Conservative Party. These parallels aren't aren't perfect. You know, do you defund the entire Metropolitan Police because of the number of rapists and racists they've been found to have in their ranks? They are not perfect analogies, but they are pertinent. The notion of of, of, of responding to allegations against a tiny proportion of a workforce by withdrawing funding from the entire work of the entire workforce is a little odd from the outside, and we've spent two hours trying to make it a little less odd. Um, and we failed. I, I don't think anybody has really managed to to do that. But we have perhaps come to a better understanding of what the um, what the hope is. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after twelve is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Now I am fairly confident that the next conversation we are going to have does not leave uh, either of us open to. Um, some of the unpleasantness that perhaps inevitably will always accompany conversations about uh, the situation in the Middle East and the, the, the conflict in Gaza in particular. But it is a strange one. I, I, I'm not doing the private schools conversation today because uh, a few of you pointed out that it's it, well, it's a phone-in host's dream, but it's not necessarily the most uh, um, relevant issue facing the population at the moment. And we've done quite a lot already for everybody suggesting that I should be talking about the coming changes to border rules. We went in quite deep on that on Friday, and we will do again. Um, but the uh, uh, sort of broader question of when people are going to actually start having rather more honest conversations about Brexit is constantly bubbling away in the back of my mind. I don't know, but I feel that it's coming. I feel the time is getting closer, and it's probably coming around a little bit quicker than I thought it would. Uh, whether as a consequence or despite Keir Starmer's relative quiet on the issue, I don't know. It's too early to say. But you, you're getting quite a lot of um, quite a lot of stuff about the uh, reality of what people voted for coming home to roost at the moment. Um, so I want to talk about the government's announcement. And I, I, vaping is a weird one for me. I somehow have managed to, despite having two teenage children. I, I've somehow managed to almost completely bypass it. In the office, I'm always interested. I don't think I'll mention any names, but I'm always interested by who has like strong opinions on a subject, and it's often not the people that you expect to. And I'm always interested by who's got a sort of personal investment in the subjects as well. I'm so out of the loop on this conversation for reasons that I can't fully understand. I have never had even the vaguest puff or toke or whatever the correct technical term may be. I have never, I don't think I've ever held a vape in my hand. And yet over the last few years, the scale of the story has become bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where today the government is to ban disposable vapes. And the reason why they are doing this, they say, is to address the massive take-up of vaping among the younger generation. I, I, we wondered at the time of Rishi Sunak's announcement of a ban on the sale of cigarettes to anyone born after the 1st of January 2009, whether it was undermined or, or likely to be undermined by the popularity and prevalence of vaping. And this would seem to suggest that they share that concern. It's going to come in early next year, by which time we might have a different government, of course. And so there are some people objecting to it. Uh, uh, and this is um, a, a wonderful example of the uh, uh, reason why it's very important to know who pays the wages of Tufton Street think tanks, because up pops Tufton Street's favourite politician, Liz Truss, uh, to describe Sunak's plan to ban cigarettes progressively as being profoundly unconservative. And and I think that might be the way into this conversation for us today. That there are two elements to it. There is the education regarding vaping. I was under the impression that it was more or less fine 
to vape for a while. And then I heard stories about children being hospitalized with all sorts of problems. And, and also like 11 year olds being addicted. And they are designed to taste like sweets as well, of course, I'm told. That's the thing. That was my introduction really to them was sort of walking down the street and saying, blimey, that smells like someone's boiling Haribo over there. So someone's making a Haribo syrup over there. On a, a, What on earth is that smell? And it turned out to be vaping. My children, who I don't talk about much on the program because it's bad enough having me for a dad without me putting their business all over the airwaves. But they uh, did their own. They, they started telling me some time ago that vaping was not very good for you. Um, and... I can't remember why, but they even found some research somewhere that told them it was um, it was worse than smoking cigarettes, which I was fairly confident wasn't true. But I thought, well, if they're believing that and they're not smoking cigarettes, then I'll leave that one unchallenged, I think, and then they'll end up doing neither. And touch wood, and I know that some dads may naively think that their children haven't discovered certain vices when, in fact, they have. Uh, Jason... <coughs> Um, a few people telling me that, that you need to be careful on this, but I, I I don't get it. I don't get it. And I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. That's that's essentially the question. What do you think of this proposal? I really, really, really like it. I don't, I don't care about these libertarian arguments. I really don't. In fact, the older I get, the more ridiculous I find them. Oh, you've got to give people the freedom to hurt themselves. Why? Why? Well, I mean, disposable vapes sound disgusting. They're appalling for the environment because you throw them away. You've got these lumps of moulded plastic all over the place. And somehow, and this perhaps is one element of the conversation we should discuss, I think young people have ended up in a place where they've got no idea how much damage they're doing to themselves. So let's begin with that. How much damage are they doing to themselves? 0345 6060 973. And how have we ended up in a place where people didn't realise how much damage they were doing. So I remember when the cigarettes were banned, it was a bit like when payday loans were banned. I just said, look, these people will find another way of getting their money. Government steps in and turns that tap off and they'll pop up and turn another tap on. I think that there's been a huge explosion in online gambling since they shut down payday loan companies. And I, for one, would not be enormously shocked if some of the people behind the explosion in online gambling with the same people that were behind the explosion in payday loans. But there is a sort of an attitude to business. You see that you see the population almost as a crop that you can harvest every every year. And, and once you close down one mode of harvest, they just come up with another one. Excuse me, I've got a tickly throat today. It's probably because I haven't stopped talking since 10 o'clock. And and I saw I thought the same about smoking. I thought when well, they're banning this, they're turning off a big old tap there with the smoking ban. And I don't mean the ban on sales, which is due to come in well, which has come in for people of a certain age. I mean the ban on smoking in public places. It's going to take huge chunks out of the market. And I thought, well, they'll come up with another one. They'll come up with other ways of making their money. And I'm fairly confident that big tobacco is neck deep in the in the so called vaping industry. So What's wrong with the gov? This is a question I've got for you. And I know there are answers to this that are compelling and persuasive. And I should probably admit that you might persuade me. But the problem that the so-called libertarian position has for me in this country is that all of the people pursuing it are horrible. I mean, they're either stupid or unpleasant or both. I use Liz Truss as a, as a, as a, as a shining example. An extraordinarily inept politician possessed inexplicably of the view that she's a genius so i think as a younger man I, I would have leant towards the idea that government shouldn't interfere in my right to do unhealthy things you know i don't think the government should limit my uh, freedom to do unhealthy things because i really liked doing unhealthy things as a younger person but the older i get the more i think what's the point of having governments if they're not trying to at least encourage us to look after ourselves. I always think of Jamie Oliver and those mums who were shoving turkey twizzlers through the chain link fence at the school where he was trying to bring in healthy school meals. And I sort of thought, well, build a bigger fence. These people are foolish. Jamie Oliver is showing more concern for their children's health than they are. So <clears throat> it's where the phrase nanny state comes from. 
isn't it? The idea that the state does have a responsibility sometimes to protect the population from itself. And I think the reason I'm so rude about people who call themselves libertarians is that they seem to ignore the existence of anybody else. It's often highly educated and privileged people who insist that people who are not highly educated or privileged should be free to continue pouring money into the pockets of whoever it is that secretly funds their think tanks. I find it extraordinary, for example, when they talk about a sugar tax on fizzy drinks, that nobody points out when claiming freedom issues, nobody points out that your freedom is enormously compromised by the amount of money that's spent on encouraging you to pour fizzy drinks down your throat and your children's throat, in contrast to the amount of money that's spent on encouraging you not to. So what else do you need there, if not a tax? You have a ban on advertising, but vapes seem to sidestep that. I don't really see vapes being advertised on the telly, but you're probably not allowed to, are you? I don't know. You don't need to advertise them because every shop you walk past has got 400 in the window. So I, I completely understand why children have been drawn to them. I don't understand how we've ended up with this curious juxtaposition of popularity coupled with ignorance. I don't know how bad they are for you, but I do know this. And I, and I think this carries a little bit more weight than usual because I'm normally quite critical of the current government. I don't know whether you've noticed that. I think this is a bloody brilliant idea. I think the idea of getting rid of something that is bad for the people that do it, bad for the environment in which it is done, and bad for just about every element of, of the population that comes into contact with it, is, is an unalloyed good, and I think it's quite brave, given that Rishi Sunak comes from the same party that Liz Truss comes from, and they are very much in the, uh, in the pockets of the secretly funded think tanks doing the bidding of their secret donors without ever telling you who it is that pays their wages, and they always come out against sugar taxes and smoking bans, and um, Liz Truss even talking about the ban on cigarette sales being profoundly unconservative. Uh, I, I think this is a really good idea. And you are welcome to try to stop me from uh, thinking that. 0345 606 is the number you need. Is this a very, very rare example of Rishi Sunak doing something both bold and important? Because some people won't like it. It will have a, an impact upon uh, uh, various levels of society. And a ban is, in some senses at least, likely to annoy people who consider themselves to be conservatives or, or at least libertarian. So I like this ban and I want to know what you think of it. 0345 6060 And I mentioned a moment ago, being a younger man, I'm pretty sure that as a younger man, the word ban was provocative to me. I, I think I didn't like bans. I don't know what's changed. This is me getting a bit more small c conservative as I get older, but then it up pops Liz Trust to say that this isn't a conservative policy at all. It's almost like nobody knows what that word means anymore. So it's not just a question of whether you support the ban on disposable vapes or whether you oppose the ban on disposable vapes. It's also a question of um, freedom. It's a question of whether or not this is the sort of thing that governments should be doing. Because... I find that one a little bit harder to answer. I'm very surprised to find myself at the age of 52 on the side of the government banning things that are unhealthy. But I am on their side. Perhaps you need to remind me why I shouldn't be. 03456060973 is the number you need. The time is 12.16. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 19 minutes after 12. There's two, I often say there's two topics here. There's like the micro and the macro, isn't there? There's the conversation about what we think about a politician banning vapes, disposable vapes. Um, I, it's a bit like trying to put the genie back in the bottle, I would argue, but good luck. I like it. And then there's a question about governments banning things that are bad for us just because they're bad for us and whether or not that is totalitarian or undesirable. I don't know why my voice went up several octaves as I said both of those words. Totalitarian. I shouldn't like it, but I do. How many more topics can I get away with turning into free therapy sessions for me, do you think? I shouldn't like this, but I do. I don't vape, but I don't, I don't like the idea of a ban on governments brought in by governments on vaping. I don't like that because I'm rebellious and anti-authority, but I do like it. I really like it. I love the idea they should do more. They should ban, like, you know, palm oil and trans fats and all sorts of other things as well. Ban it. 
I'm becoming a fan. I'm becoming, in middle age, a ban fan. And I don't understand why. Perhaps you can tell me. 20 minutes after 12 is the time. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this name. Is it Flav, as in Flavor Flav? Or is it Flav? Uh, it's actually Slav. Slav um, with yeah. an S. Yes. Well, someone's yes. put Flav with an F on my screen, which made me think of Flavor Flav. But well, I'm glad it we would have... be a good name. It, no. would be, it would be a good name. Unfortunately, Slav, someone's beaten you to it. Now, what made you pick up the phone? What would you like to say? So uh, what I would like to say is that although I do feel, and certainly when I was younger, I was more of a libertarian myself. Mm. But as I grow older and uh, I become more conscious of like uh, why the healthcare system actually exists for, yes. I think it is fair for the government to introduce measures up to like banning certain things because it then has a duty to take care of your health through the public health care system in whatever state it is. But that's a different discussion, right? Yes. So yes. because government is an agency of the taxpayer, which is the society, and we as a society take care of our own, then I think it's fair that we should be able to, in a way, prevent them from hurting themselves in the first place so we don't need to spend as much funds on them treating them. Because there is no law which says that a vapor is not eligible for health care because they were hurting themselves. I know, and, and I mean, I certainly wouldn't want a law like that, although you do have, I think, cases of operations being postponed for people who haven't given up smoking or haven't lost weight. So there is, it's not, it's not a zero-sum game, is it, on taking personal responsibility for your health before you can access certain health care, before you can access certain health interventions. But how confident are you that vaping is really unhealthy? Because it's obviously much healthier than smoking cigarettes. That is true, and uh, I, I would not argue with that. I mean, like, if uh, you can call it a, like a lesser of two evils, if you yes, like. Yes, exactly that. But, uh, but ultimately, I think there is this, like, more moral argument, if you like, that do we as a society take care of our own? Because to me, it sounds a little bit like inhumane to deny people health care because they did something wrong. Yes. I mean, like, we all do mistakes. We are all human for making mistakes. Yes. I think that's what part of what makes us human. But then, if we do, like, say, forgive, we certainly don't want to encourage. Because then it creates this sort of, like, uh, like, like a, a moral problem that uh, people will perhaps be more lenient and as to how they take care of their health because, because they know, they know there's be... a massive big safety net catching them at the end of it. Well, I, d I mean, subconsciously, Slav, I think they might they might feel that way. It'd be quite hard to prove, wouldn't it, behaviourally, that because of the because of the strength of the NHS, people are more likely to behave in an unhealthy manner. It's not an argument I've heard before, and I like it, but I don't know that you'd be able you'd be able to prove it. One thing I can prove. Thank you, Slav. Um, uh, one thing I can prove is that they've nicked this wholesale off the Labour Party. October 2023, uh, West Streeting threatens to come down like a ton of bricks on the vaping industry. The Shadow Health Secretary said the government is asleep at the wheel as more children become addicted. So a timely reminder there of two things. Number one, one of the reasons why the Labour Party has been a little bit, um, well, has, has not taken much notice of all of the people demanding that they release more policies, demanding that they release, because if they release a policy that proves popular, uh, Rishi Sunak will nick it, as he has done apparently with the vaping policy today. But number two, a, a reminder also of the dangers of footballification. If you liked this when Wes Streeting announced it, you're not allowed to dislike it when Rishi Sunak announces it. You're allowed, if you're a Labour loyalist, to be a little bit peeved at theft, blatant policy theft, but it doesn't change your qualitative judgment of said policy, does it? And no one's yet had a go at trying to explain why in middle age I'm becoming a band fan, much to my own surprise. Hamza's in Barnet. Hamza, what would you like to say? Uh, hello, James. I hope everything's okay with yourself. So do I now. You've um, got me worried. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, talking about this issue, uh, there's a few things which will obviously come to mind straight away. First and foremost, I want to make it clear that I am on your side with regards to... Uh, the libertarianism that's going on right now. Yeah. Um, I think governments should. Uh, I think governments are entirely in the right in the right when doing things for their own society will benefit its yes. people. Yes. Um, I don't see any issues with that. Uh, the obvious issues that come to mind when uh, you put bans on these like uh, on these on these vaping products and addictive products 
is first and foremost the black market which arises, which is something that that obviously will be looked into and that 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 needs to be looked into. Um, with regards to that black market, the one thing that I would say that I am concerned with is if it's the younger generation that are really into these vaping uh, vaping addictions and whatnot. As you said, there's 11 year olds who are addicted, for example. Um, does it give them an incentive to access the black market at such a young age because of the addiction that they've gained? Yeah, I mean, well, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Because you would arguably, if you haven't already developed an addiction, then this will make it harder for the next generation or the upcoming generations yeah, to, develop a, to develop an addiction. But the... Yeah. Um, but then the ones that are already addicted are, are going to go down the market and start buying all sorts of dodgy stuff that's actually already exactly. illegal because of the the strength of the and the and the, and the scale of the doses. But well, you tell me then, because that's not. I mean, that 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 throws some nuance into the discussion, but it doesn't end it one way or the other, does it? No, one hundred percent. And my main worry with it with, regarding this black market is if we if we if we're introducing a black market first and foremost let's say there's a 12 year old that's that's addicted to vaping now um if they find access to this black market somehow some way uh, which is very possible in today's society with all these mobile phones and and social media and whatnot uh, i'm speaking like i'm a, i'm an oldie i'm really not honestly but um <laughs> if if these 12 year olds do gain access to the black market at such a young age what? How? If we're teaching them what a black market is at such a young age, who yeah, but you can anything, and you could say this about anything, couldn't you? you yeah, could, you know, you know. I, I know that the, the the availability of the illegal vape is obviously much higher, yeah. and they are more dangerous than the legal variety. But you could, you could, by you know, by saying. If you make something illegal, you push people underground. You can apply that to absolutely anything, I think. Yeah, 100%. So I don't know. But I like your thinking. I like your argument. But I don't know that the creation of demand for black market disposable vapes is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a... And I know you're not arguing that it is. You're just bringing it into the mix. It's a conclusive argument against a ban on, on legal disposable vapes. It, I, I mean, the plausibility question, God, that's the word of the day, isn't it? How plausible a policy this is, how feasible, feasible a policy this is, I don't know. Because if you're not allowed to sell them in shops, there is going to be a huge decline in the number of people buying them. Full stop. I mean, there's no earthly way that the black market can expand to uh, a, a scale that would fill the hole left by the by the legal market. I, I don't think there is. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I doubt it. On that element of the conversation, Helen is in Moira in Northern Ireland. Helen, what would you like to say? Yeah, I think it just needs to be a bit more um, logical legislation because blanket banning something that actually supports people to quit. I get, like, youth vaping is an issue, right? Like, 100%, just like back in the day, youth smoking was quite an issue. Yes. Um, and that... With more legislation, you can stop that. But the cause is just it, the youth smoking. If that's what they're trying to cut out, then it impacts on people who are trying to quit. And this is a really another really good way um, of adults quitting smoking. Um, and the incidence in the UK is coming down because the UK is quite open to vaping. There's lots of other countries around the world that aren't, and their smoking rates are in some cases increasing. Oh, that's interesting. Um, how? How? Because we're going to run out of time. How important is then the distinction when you talk about proportionality between disposable and non-disposable? Getting rid of disposable vapes doesn't stop anybody vaping, whether they're a child or not, but it makes it much it, less likely on the child's case because of the cost involved. Potentially, but it also, if there was more legislation around the retailers being responsible, because they shouldn't, it's illegal to sell it to an under 18. Yeah, but good so luck with it, that. Like, they can't even like arrest alcohol. shoplifters anymore. They're not going to go start <laughs> arresting shopkeepers, are they? But if they look linked it to alcohol, so in, you need an, a license to sell alcohol in the UK. Yeah. If it was linked to that, and then if you have, That's if you true. get age verified, so trading standards go in and you sell alcohol to an under 18 year old, you lose your license. So you lose a revenue stream. So it encourages re retailers to be more responsible because in theory, kids shouldn't be vaping. They shouldn't be able to get hold of it. But somebody's selling it to them. So if you clamp down on those people, it allows any adult consumer to choose what they're consuming. Um, so it's not necessarily the, like killing the libertarians, but it means then that people can still access this stuff if they want to. Um so, no, I no, I like it. Well, yeah, I mean, we will have to wait and see the detail of the policy, whoever brings it in, because it, it's pro pro more likely to be a Labour government that's actually in place if and when it actually happens. But the, uh, uh, the, 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 the other side of the argument, you like the sort of principle as opposed to the practice of it, is, is at least as interesting. And I don't know. I mean, if you're addicted to nicotine, aren't you, if you vape? And then if the, if the 
Disposable vapes are banned. What does the nicotine addict do? Nick their dad's cigarettes. Probably. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure Rishi Sunak knows. Nobody knows. But I'm still asking the questions. It's half past twelve, and Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.34, and um, it's all about the vapes, about the vapes, about the vapes. It's all about the vapes. Uh, Gary's in Ilford. Gary, what can you tell me? Hi, James. Um, I have a son. Um, he's 15 now, but um, six months ago, um, he started vaping. Right. He had a girlfriend who encouraged him to do so. <sighs> um, oh, that's the story. Jezebel. Um, <laughs> yes. And we only found out a couple of weeks ago. All right. Um, but he's petrified because he moved very quickly, moved from nicotine yeah. vapes to seeking out THC vapes which are cannabis and they're illegal presumably uh, uh, well, well as I understand well, I don't know well, if, I, well I, it must I, be if, if it's got if it's got the psychoactive ingredient in it then it must be illegal oh I think the psychoactive one is but there's, a, there's another one which doesn't have the psychoactive version well, then, it was, it was okay. experimenting all right, well, that's not um, got THC in it then, because th- THC is the psychoactive ingredient. And, and I think the reason why they're available is because of the states in America that have legalized cannabis, where you can get it in everything these days, from biscuits through to chewing gum and vape. So anyway, but so, so it, I mean, it won't be illegal unless it's got the THC in it, but carry on. Okay, but, but he's experimenting uh, at yes. this point, and, um, and he's experimenting with things that are, you know, the bachelorities, people turning up at school, yeah, um, and 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 he found that he got a vape that he he's very concerned has spice in it because um, the, um, the illegal vapes yes. apparently are like have a spice, and and his friends you know and himself work themselves up into a frenzy um, of, of fear because they think they've done brain damage, you know, permanent really? damage to their brains with um, you know they're all petrified. Now the problem is well, you live and learn. Well, You'd know um, if you'd taken spy. I mean, I, I, I spoke to someone who was in prison 14. for... Deep, no, no, but I've spoke to someone who's been in prison for dealing drugs and, and, and smoked spice once and spent 12 hours flat on their back on, the, on a prison cell floor and couldn't... I mean, you, you would know if you had taken spice. You wouldn't be left there wondering whether you have or not. It would be hit you around the head like a shovel. Oh, I don't know. Um, I do. I'm Just I, to put I, his I, mind at rest, if, if, okay, if he'd yeah. taken spice, he'd flipping well know about it. OK, but... but He's moved from nicotine to cannabis another substance. and then to illegal to stuff when you don't know what you're inhaling. So you've got to get him off the nicotine. And would a ban on disposable vapes help or not help? Oh, well, in the immediate context, I'd say absolutely yes. But what we've done, we're buying our 15-year-old son nicotine vapes of, uh, at a, a, a lower concentration that he was taking because I think it was 20 milligrams or something like that. So we've got the weakest... Um, possible concentration, and we're going to eat him off them, but that's the plan, over the next couple of weeks, um, three or four weeks. I used to smoke, and it takes a little period to kind of come off the... Well, you've got till January. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so you can it, nail it. it. I'm struck by them all being terrified. Are you sure he's not swinging the lead a bit to, to, to keep his dad sweet? What did he do? Come and say to your dad, I'm really worried because I've become addicted to these vapes you didn't know I was using. Um, I, I haven't had the conversation. My wife's having the conversation. Oh, okay. Because I don't, I can't quite. It's a while it. since I was fifteen, but I don't know that I'd be. Oh, I'm really frightened. I might have taken something accidentally and damaged my brain. Um, well, he, he has uh, he has um, other conditions, which means he, okay. he delves very deeply into anything. But you mentioned all his mates to... are the same as well. All his mates are terrified as well. I, I think you need to put their mind at rest that they probably haven't done anything. If they had done themselves any lasting damage, Gary, I'm pretty sure they would know about it. I, I mean, again, I can't in the same hour go from admitting my own profound ignorance about the issue to, 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 to counselling you and your son on how worried you should and shouldn't be. But I, I, I mean, I'm interested in that addiction that he has to a nicotine vape and knowing a little about addiction, the, the, the moment that that supply of disposable vapes is cut off, the first reaction of an addict would be to find another way of... Um, feeding your habit, wouldn't it? And that would involve either paying a lot more money for non-disposable vapes, which would probably bring down your usage solely on cost grounds, or, and this would be the worry um, raised earlier, or going underground, going going onto an illegal market for considerably less healthy and less regulated product, which it sounds like he's already done. Joe's in Islington. Joe, what do you reckon? 
Hi. So you've actually just touched upon um, something very important. Really? Uh, There's a first time for everything, Joe. (laughs) Which is that there are two types of vapes. There are disposable vapes and there are reusable vapes. And as far as I'm aware, the proposed legislation just targets disposable vapes. So in many ways, this is more an environmental policy than it is an actual public health policy. Um, Because you will, you know, we're talking about, for example, children here who have access to vapes. They may not be able to buy their, you know, five pound vape from the local corner shop and throw it in the bin after school, but they will still be able to access and use vapes, but they will just have to buy a vaping product that is refillable and then buy the cartridges that refill it. So it's not quite as clear cut as um, it's going to be completely banned and completely inaccessible. So, well, the disposable ones will be. Yeah, just the disposable ones. And that will only really affect, well, okay, so... Yeah. If you were 15, would that make you? That means you're going to struggle. You're going to have to work a bit harder to get a hit, right? Poten- potentially, I mean, so dis- disposable vapes are about five pounds in your local. Three corner pounds, shops. I heard. Three pounds sometimes, yeah. or nine it, pounds it, for three. Someone, yeah, one of my colleagues, me. told me this morning. I mean, I think the big, the bigger thing here, which the, which the government could be doing, is actually dealing with the way when you go into these corner shops. Whereas cigarettes, for example, as we know, they're hidden. You can't visibly yes, the see vapes them. Are, I look, they look like Haribo, don't they? Yeah, they exactly. look like, they look like a big ray of sweets. Exactly. They're right at the front of the counter next to sweets that are almost always on offer. And the flavours. I'm sounding so old, Joe, but here we go. In for a penny, in for a pound. The flavours are like... It's like it's like something out of Willy Wonka. I know, but the, the advantage is when you come home from a nightclub, you now smell a pineapple and bubble gum rather than cigarettes. So that's, that's an big, upside. But no, that is a that yeah. is a massive upside. So you're allowed to smoke them indoors, then you're allowed to vape indoors, or do people just do it anyway? You're not supposed to. People tend to do it. They tend to get away with it more. But I think you've, it's a very important point that you've mentioned here, which is that it's the fl- it's packaging and the flavours, right? Because I don't know if you remember in yeah. 2020, the government the government banned methanol cigarettes, so minty cigarettes, menthol. W- Menthol, sorry, cigarettes. Yeah. You know, which had they, they had a little bit of mint in them. Yes, I remember of, those. I used to think they were terribly sophisticated. <laughs> so the logic was is that you know by having a minty burst of flavour, you're encouraging smoking. But yeah. at the same time, with vapes, the you can have a are, lemon sherbet vape, but exactly. you can't have a minty cigarette. It is a it, yeah. is a it is a very very strange one. And if they wiped out all of the sweety flavours, mm. I'd say they'd probably wipe out eighty percent of the appeal. Exactly. In fact, you should only be able to have vapes that taste like cigarettes, and then the kids yeah. would give them up in a heartbeat. Cigarettes and cardboard flavour. Cigarettes and, and cardboard flavour. I like it. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's a funny one. I mean, the more we talk about it, the more you wonder how big an impact this is likely to have, um, simply because of the shift to permanent. What's the word of non-disposable? Non-disposable vapes but then you're back to the shop question so most shop and listen don't at me with uh, accusations of naivety most shopkeepers have a frisson of fear as indeed do most publicans about being caught selling booze to underage customers it is actually enforced I, this is one of the things i know from having teenage children is that id is a big deal and if id is a big deal it means they're getting asked for it a lot more than we were when we were 16 or 17 so if you could somehow uh, translate that concern among shopkeepers and publicans about alcohol into that similar concern about vapes, then you'd probably deal with the problem a lot more effectively. But there's almost certainly a flaw in that thinking, otherwise a politician would have pointed it out already. Richard's in Clacton. Richard, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think it is an absolutely fantastic idea. Why? Um, pretty much like you last time I said, it's not all vaping that's being... Um, so why is it about why do you hate disposable vapes but you're comfortable with non-disposable ones? What's the difference in your mind? Um, well, why were the disposable ones invented basically for children? Were they? Because they can use them when they're out, when they're finished, they just throw them away. Whereas if they've got one they've got to use the whole time, then there's more chance of their parents finding them. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, OK. I wonder what the breakdown is, actually, generationally or de- de- demographically, between the... Um, the usage, if you you know, if you find it, here is a disposable vape, what percentage of users is likely to be a child as opposed to an adult? I don't know that I've seen any research well, I mean, on I, that. I, I myself and I, I my brother, good friend, have been using vapes for years. Yeah. And we wouldn't even consider a disposable one. Why would you? The reusable ones, you spend, you can get one for 30 quid, which then costs a couple of, couple of pounds a month to maintain. Right. If you choose and yeah, uh, so the, yeah, so so it is, it is, it is about targeting. The disposable ones are designed almost exclusively for children. And my colleague, who shall be, 
who shall remain nameless, who 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 has a, has a minor disposable vape habit despite being in his mid twenties or her or her mid twenties. I don't want to give you any clues at all as to who I am talking about. Uh, it's coming up to quarter to one. Um, no one yet has had a go at why I at the age of 52, have become a band fan. I'm pretty sure, if you were kind enough to listen to this programme 100 years ago when I started, uh, we, must have, we must do some centenary celebrations, Keith. We should, get, we should get, 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 get a theme tune or something like that up and running. I'm pretty sure I was anti-ban. I was not a band fan. I'd be like, no, I must be free to do myself harm. And uh, I, I've been, one of the many journeys I've been on as a consequence of having this job, realising that the worst thing you can do is think that the entire world should be legislated for according to your own outlooks, privileges and experience. Because if you do that, then you ignore everybody else. But I am a little bit surprised at this tender age to find myself developing quite a fat band fan streak. Why do you think that is? 03456060973. And what are the long-term effects of disposable vapes? Are they, are they worse than the long-term effects of non-disposable vapes? I, I do not know. But I do know they nicked this policy off West Streeting. And if I was him, I'd be a little bit hacked off. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.48 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I did quite like this story from Will. He goes, I've got a friend who's so addicted to vaping that he started smoking to wean himself off the vapes. His logic is that he intrinsically knows cigarettes are bad and will eventually need to kick those. And because he knows sort of intrinsically in his bones that they're bad for him, he'll find it easier to give those up than he would giving up the vapes without using the cigarettes as a sort of bridging tactic, a crutch to get you to the point where you need to give up both. I've no idea uh, if that will work. Um, and John, well, we're finding a lighter side of this conversation. John says, flavoured vapes are the closest some kids will come to getting their five a day. You've given me an idea there, actually, is that you could have carrot flavour vape. You could only have vapes that are flavoured like vegetables. That would probably stop the problem of children vaping, wouldn't it? Carrot and pea. Oh, and I must thank the team at San Agur, who heard me the other day, raving about the delicious consequences of adding some of the Santagur cream cheese to Brussels sprouts, and they sent me some cheese and some sprouts. That's rock and roll, that is, kids. That's showbiz. That's how it works, this business. Seriously, you work hard at school. You might get sent sprouts and cheese one day by one of the country's leading dairy companies. Sprouts and cheese. Cheese and sprouts. You, you get Make me a vape that tastes of sprouts. And I'll be a 40 a day man, or whatever the equivalent. I digress slightly. Christo's in Prague. Christo, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Finally, uh, finally, I'll get to chat to you, mate. Uh, I, I love your show. Oh, Thank mate, you very so much. kind. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. You, you made me make some good decisions in my life, so I do appreciate it. Oh, a lovely thing to say. Um, Thank you. I, I, don't, I don't think the government's gone far enough, pal, Go to on. be honest. Um, I, I think they should just ban vapes in shops permanently. Wow. Um, and the reason being... I actually switched from cigarettes. I was smoking probably 15, 20 a day. Yeah. I switched to vapes. Um, within three months, uh, everything was going fine. I feel lovely, lovely. I was like, oh, you're topping up quite a lot. And yeah. I was on permanent vapes. I wasn't on the, the one-offs. And I was smoking them like mad. Um one night, woke up in the middle of the night, suddenly got an asthma attack. I've never had asthma in my life. Oh, I Lord. Used to do, I used to have a lot of sport. Right. I've represented uh, countries in How many? sports. How many countries uh, have you South, represented? South Africa. I represented South Africa. Okay. In sports. Yeah. Yeah, for roll hockey, ice hockey, and taekwondo. Flipping it, mate. Um, wow. I then, I then left. I you then left South Africa. Yeah, I then left South Africa. I then uh, started actually playing for a club in the UK. Um, I was offered to play in the UK. And unfortunately, the word we shall not speak um, came up. And I went, no, nah, I'm not happy here anymore, unfortunately. Oh, I don't feel well. my, wife, my wife does, yeah. No, I thought I could go. I know, but I, know, I, know, I it, didn't know what. I thought we were going a bit weird then, Christo. But no, crikey. It, no, I can't. Well, I can. Right? I'd be out of a job if I didn't. My entire profile is built on it. Like okay. Voldemort and Harry Potter. You can't Do, say that. The, 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 he who <laughs> shall not be named. Do you yeah. know for sure that the asthma was brought on by your excessive vaping? One hundred percent. And well, the reason never... being, the reason being, I had it. Luckily, my wife um, has got asthma herself. Right. Uh, she went, 
Oh, well, he's having an asthma attack. Oh, she gave okay. me the pump. Yeah. Uh, I Did hit she? it. I hit I it. Say. I, I hit it three times. She saved me. She saved me. You know, she, luckily she loves me. Um, well, evident, clearly. <laughs> um, I, I did it. So, but but day, don't, I don't know. Listen, you're doing the thing I just said we shouldn't do, is that you're taking your personal experiences, pumps and all, <laughs> and thinking that they should be used to frame legislation for the entire population. A lot yeah. of people successfully wean themselves off cigarettes by vaping, and then I think... Correct then I think they knock the vaping on the head subsequently, don't they? Or, Correct. Or, so I don't Correct. know that your call for an outright ban is... is Correct. Is, is, I agree with yeah, you. Yeah. But Good. when I spoke to more people, and I fully agree with you, when I spoke to more people that were actually open about vaping, yes. um, a lot of my friends that switched to vaping turned around and went, I've got breathing problems. They haven't given up at I, all. I, I am I am battling. Uh, a lot of them were actually vaping more than what they smoked. Yeah, well, that is um, that that is really interesting, actually. <laughs> so that is, it's sort of causing problems, as, even as we're constantly told that it solves. And Christo, I'm going to crack on because there's loads of people wanting to contribute. But thank you for your lovely, kind words. And I look forward to talking to you again. Um, so they're nibbling at the edge, really, of, of, of the problems with this. But if you're specifically addressing children, then getting rid of the disposable vapes, I haven't yet heard any powerful arguments why it's not at least worth doing. Retailers get... Six months to implement it. How big a chunk is it going to take out of a newspaper's newspapers and news agent's profits? A ban on disposable vapes. I mean, some of the shops near me have a lot of them. A lot of them. I wouldn't know the difference between a disposable and a non-disposable. But everything behind the counter. Oh no, because then you get the ones that <clears throat> the ones that you use to fill up a permanent vape. They look a little bit more business-like. Am I right? Or can or I don't know what I'm talking about. Liam's in Bristol. Liam, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How you doing? Good, mate. What's on your mind? Okay, so um, I just really think this is just a blunt instrument. I just think it's a knee-jerk reaction by our government. They don't understand the problem, and the problem they're going to face is counterfeiting, and counterfeiting in in the context of I'll give you a good example. Yeah. My my son who was thirteen. Um, he started selling counterfeit vapes. Did he? He got yes, he did. Go and on. he got the, he got them from somebody who was uh, somebody older. It was kind of a gateway route into into becoming you know a dealer. That What's the appeal of a counterfeit vape? It's cheaper than a non counterfeit one, and it contains more doses. Is that what we're talking about? Well, I think there's three. This is where it's not been implemented properly. Is that you buy from? You'd have to buy from a shop. So you, there's no one asking how old you are. Yeah. It's probably stronger and it's cheaper. Yeah. And he was, and we found out about this. He was making very good money. How much? Uh, he was he was cleaning about two hundred pounds a week Blimey. selling them. It's not bad. And that was happening even while his friends could buy disposable vapes legally. So why would it make things worse necessarily to ban the the legal ones? Because you could make this argument about everything. You could say, you know, counterfeit. I don't know, trainers or can, can, all, you know, what counterfeit handbags, counterfeit puffer jackets. If the, the more you b ban the, no, that doesn't work. No one's going to ban trainers, are they? You, you it, Try and imagine what argument I was about to make, Liam. I know, I know what you're saying. But try and imagine is, the argument I was about to make and respond to it, please. Okay. So my, my point is, is so that if you, if, if you ban, <laughs> if you ban uh, vapes from, yeah. from Standard then you're going to go. Retail. Then you're going to go for the dodgy stuff. You're going to go underground. People are going to go underground, and that'll be less going... regulated, less safe, and and less. So what I'm saying is, still do the ban, but don't do it as a knee-jerk reaction for popular votes. Do it as a proper program mm. of uh, getting to the counterfeiters, having a proper process, proper legal route to get rid of that. And I think the other part of that is education, because there's nothing. I mean, I I'm a child of the '80s, so I remember the the uh, the anti uh, HIV yeah the anti HIV which scared the living daylights out of me and changed my behaviour pretty quickly what on, earth, you, what on earth were you doing in the 1980s that exposed well, you, you know, to the risk of HIV I was I was a good looking lad but anyway <laughs> <laughs> oh well I'm, yeah all right we covered quite a lot of ground here with you and Christo but um but I know I do take your point and that's why perhaps. The fact that the Tories appear to have just pinched it from the Labour Party doesn't doesn't fill you with confidence, but it doesn't necessarily make it a bad idea. And, and you use the word knee-jerk a lot. You, you would hope 
that the um, that the clampdown on because it's already illegal to sell any vape to anyone under eighteen. So uh, if they'd come in harder on that, it might have made more sense. But it is the disposable vapes sold in smaller, more colourful packaging than the refillable ones that are apparently the key driver behind the alarming rise in youth vaping. I I um, I, I accept and also dismiss your argument, Liam, because I think you're right. I think there would obviously be an uptick in if you like, illegal or counterfeit vapes, but it would not It would still have a very, very big, a much, much bigger impact on the amount of kids using the non-counterfeit or the, or the sort of official ones. Tom's in Maidenhead. Last word to you on this, Tom. What's it going to be? I, I think getting rid of them is a good idea. I personally started them because they taste good. They taste like fruit. They taste like they one of your They don't taste like best. fruit. They, they taste as sweet as you want them yeah, to Yeah, they taste, taste like good. sweets. They don't taste like fruit. You could get the fruit-flavoured ones. Yeah, but you get fruit-flavoured sweets. They don't taste like fruit either. They taste like sweets. The point I'm making is they don't taste like anything harmful. Smoking has a a horrible aftertaste. That's a great point. That you can can taste and some people will smell it on you and it puts people off, whereas the vapes, they taste and look like a toy and yeah it's it's very very easy to but can you not buy can you not buy sweet flavored refills for the normal vapes for the permanent vapes you can the issue with that is that the packaging is a lot more from what i've experienced there's a lot child friendly um, no hazardous from the refillables they'll they'll give you your fair warning like they do Uh, on cigarettes oh okay okay well that would be another thing as well to address the packaging so no no really powerful arguments against it and no one's really had a crack at trying to work out psychologically why i've become a band fan in my early 50s it's it's, it's a bizarre state of affairs that is it from me for another day if you missed any of today's show you can listen back on catch up on global player the official lbc app where you can also pause and rewind live radio this week's full disclosure is on there as well you can download it um for free from your app store head to globalplayer.com and it's an absolute humdinger i got so many nice comments about it over the weekend with james blunt who is just an absolute superstar in every sense of the word, actually. So do check that out if you get the chance. Tom Sawbrick with you at four. James O'Brien on LBC.